We have a public forum tonight, and we also have a quorum of the council. So seeing that we have a quorum of the council, we are going to call the public forum to order at 6.02. And the purpose of the public forum is to, regarding appropriations that were not in the annual budget. Specifically in this case, it is appropriations with regard to the MSBA having approved us for the feasibility uh, study. And uh, just very quickly, when we did approve this in our previous budget, we approved it at 400,000, and we want to now increase that to 750. So the purpose of the public forum is we'll have a brief presentation, and then public comment must be at least equal to the amount of time for the presentation. So without further ado, Sonia? Uh, do you want me to call the Finance Committee to order? Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, we'll do after. that afterwards. Yeah, okay. Sonia, go ahead. I'm sorry, and Mike, nice to see there you. There we are. We don't really have a presentation um, for tonight. We have the order up on the screen here, and as um, Councillor Grismer explained, it was part of our, um, it is in, included in the uh, Joint Capital Planning Committee report that was done for fiscal year 20. It's in there for 400,000 as a borrowing authorization. The, it never went to council to vote. Um, we just got approved from MSBA. And uh, we subsequently, f we had 400,000 in there for half, to pay half of the um, feasibility study. And then we um, were recently informed that they would not reimburse us for half, so we had to increase the amount to 750. Although there is a possibility that we will be reimbursed for some expenses later in the future. Um, I think that's, I don't have a lot on this. Superintendent so Morris, yeah, please. Just to add, oh, thank you. Um, thank you. To add to what Sonia said, this is the first part of what's called the enrollment period. Mm -hmm. And there were many steps. I think last time I was here, we talked about them. And funding the feasibility is one of the steps and during this enrollment period that will you know, get us to actually doing a feasibility study. And to the point that Sonia raised about the, the dollar amount, the way MSBA works is you have to fund the full amount regardless of reimbursement. Um, in this situation, this situation, our reimbursement's uncertain, but uh, even if it was more certain, you fund the full amount and then you get reimbursed by the MSBA. So um, regardless of whether we were planning or not planning to receive any money back, that's the way their procedures currently work, that you, you fund the full amount and hope that some of it comes back. Okay. And I want to thank the council for their continued support in this process, which is exciting, daunting, long, uh, quite a long process, but it, it does require some funds, and this is what we're here to talk about tonight. Okay. Are there any brief questions from the council at this time before we move to public comment? Okay. Is there anyone here for public comment? Then we will basically look at each other for three minutes. <laughs> you have to do the three minutes. That's what the rules, that's what the charter says. Hmm. We've never discussed that before. We've never discussed. Let's talk about it, but go for the three minutes this time and then discuss it. It took you a year to bring that up. No. Yeah. <laughs> shh, 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 shh. <laughs> Please ignore the quiet debate. All right, seeing that it is now six minutes after six. Um, I am going to ask for a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 It's uh, 11 yes and none, abs none abs I'm sorry, and no, no no's, no abstentions, and two absent at this point. Okay. 
Uh, we are going to go immediately into a finance committee meeting because the order that we looked at during the finance committee was different than the order we're looking at now. And so um, if those that are not on the finance committee would like to take a brief break, please do so. Otherwise, I'm going to move and have Andy take over. Okay. Now, you don't need to move. Um, what I'm going to do is, first of all, call the Finance Committee to order, and before everybody leaves, there's two people here who you should meet, um, and uh, they're especially Evan. Well, lost him. Uh, there, uh, we have two, uh, our two resident members, and please come up and join us. Um, and. Uh, I want to introduce you to Sharon Povinelli and Robert Hegner, who have been resident members and have been um, really great participants in the Finance Committee and very much appreciated uh, and uh, very much part of all of our conversations. And uh, so what I wanted to do was to clarify, and uh, I don't know if Sonia has anything else that she wants to add. Um, on the screen, I think we now have uh, at the bottom, uh, Order 2068, which is being split off from um, the, the prior version of 2068 in that 2068 only encompasses now the school funding and there's a new order that we'll need to vote on so the, um, that it has to do with um, the portion that was the INET funding which was actually not the subject of a required public hearing because it was part of a public hearing on the general capital budget and in and of itself is an amount that's unchanged and this is a matter in the packet. Sonia, are there, um, you want to walk us through any other changes um, that were in this? The changes to this order, um, we included a lot of the MSBA language, the boilerplate language, so that if we are able to be reimbursed, the, um, I was gonna say article, the order's in line with that. Um, the only other part that's added in here is the, boilerplate language for um, being able to use bond premiums, any bond premiums to pay down the, the note before we bond it. Which was, uh, is the subject of another order later in the, uh, the, the finance committee already considered, but the council- you will, see, you will see this language in every single one of our borrowing authorization. It's the ch chapter 44, section 20. Portion of it, every authorization for borrowing will have this language in it now so that we can do that. What you're gonna see later on is um, to be retroactive for the authorizations that happened before MuniMod, because we have a couple of um, bands out there that we are gonna permanently bond and we're gonna wanna be able to do the same thing, pay down the premiums before we borrow. So I guess, uh, are there any questions from anyone regarding uh, the new order 2068? And the, any other members of the council certainly feel free to ask questions now because we have the opportunity. Um, if not, I think that the, uh, what I, makes sense is that we um, reconsider 2068 and the, um, if somebody decides to make a motion that we uh, as a finance committee recommend to the council the new order 2068 as it has been uh, revised. Uh, yes. So moved. Kathy and second, I second it. from Dorothy. Okay. Any discussion on this motion. Okay. Um, 
So um, I think we're ready to proceed to a vote unless there are co uh, comments from the resident members before we vote. None? Okay. Um, then for the Finance Committee, all in favor indicate by just raising hands and saying aye. 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 Uh, so it's five to zero. Uh, and uh, we can go on to the other order, which I think is now 2069. No, 2078. 2078, I'm sorry. Um, Sonia, initi Sonia put out a several other orders in between, so she had to go to 78. And I think that there's no change in this order from what would have been previous section. Um, no changes, it's just separated out. And as noted, um, this also has the language about uh, the new provisions regarding uh, funding and bonds. So, uh, any discussion, any comments? Yes, Kathy. I, it's more of a comment to make sure I understood it. So by this new wording, next year we're not going to have to do the, pre, if you get a premium authorized, the way of spending, we've already authorized it in this order? The pre, prior years, we're just, kept, we're just um, we have some bonding that we need to do that this language wasn't in, those, um, when they were articles at town meeting, the language wasn't in. So. What we're doing later on is we're just making that retroactive so that we can apply this rule to the older debt that we're about. We have a sewer debt of $3 million that we've been working on the project. It's almost done. We're probably going to go get a permanent bonding on that next fiscal year. So we want that language in there. If we, if we earn a premium, then we can take the premium off the total amount owed before we go out to bond. Okay. Um, then, um, any other comments, questions? If not, I would uh, just just. So yeah. she's saying that they're reducing the amount they're borrowing by paying the premium up front. Is that what you're saying? If we get a hundred thousand dollars of a premium, we would subtract that $100,000 from the $3 million and then we would only borrow the difference, the net amount. Okay. So um, a motion would be in order then to, um, if somebody's so inclined to recommend Town Financial Council Financial Order 2078. So moved. There's motions on the floor, seconds made and seconded. Any further discussion? There's one other item, by the way, for the Finance Committee before we adjourn. Um, and, uh, but we have the motion on the floor now. Any further discussion? Any comments from the resident members? No comments? Okay, then let's vote. All in favor indicate by raising hands and saying aye. 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 I think we're at five, five to zero. And uh, so it's complete um, for our action on those two items. The other thing just to inform the committee about and to see if there's uh, any problems, this is just under uh, business not anticipated, 48 hours. Uh, Sonia has advised us that uh, there's a meet, she has been able to schedule a meeting with our um, audit firm that did the FY19 audit, Melanson Heath, that coincides with the date of our previously scheduled next to meeting, which is now um, two weeks from tomorrow, February 25th. And uh, so the, and she's also indicated that um, the council and the entire committee um, We'll have the audit report from the auditors prior to the meeting so that uh, my proposal is, is a matter of scheduling that since we could make that arrangement and we're required actually by the charter to file a report 
audit committee is required to file a report by March 1st on the prior year's audit. So we don't have that much time anyway. <laughs> so um, my suggestion is that we um, meet with Melanson Heath um, as a major item of discussion and that afterwards we um, have discussions about other aspects of the audit committee's work, which is um, the planning for the um, agreement to the firm to uh, conduct the audit for the FY20 year, the year that we're presently in, and to engage in a process for FY21 and uh, talk about um, all three items at the next meeting. For members of the council who are interested in um, attending the meeting, um, of course, uh, I think it's always anticipated with audit committee in the past and will be in the future that those meetings and all meetings are open to the public. And if anyone is interested in attending and actually hearing from the auditors and having an opportunity to ask questions for the auditors, uh, it is 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon, then on February 25th that we will be meeting with uh, uh, the people who conducted the audit this year from the firm of Melanson Heath. Is there anything else you wanted to say on the subject, Sonia? No, I'll, I'll have the final audit meeting tomorrow. Done. Done. Oh. Okay. Can I, I'd like to just take the opportunity for the purposes of the public Mary Lou, who is unable to be with us, she's one of our resident people on resident members of the Finance Committee. She did ask the question about the selection of the amount of 750000 I will attempt to answer it based on my understanding, but you may have more to add since the superintendent's not here at this point. Um, the 750 was his best estimate. The reality is that there are studies that we have already done that may also be attributable to this work. Those, in fact, include the Fort River study, the um, Wildwood study, this present study that has just been approved for uh, Crocker Farm, as well as the sixth grade study that's going on with um, the school district as well. They may therefore say, these are really good, this is part of the studies that we need to do as, the, as part of this phase, and that may help us even reduce the price further. Okay. Anything else, Sonia? Okay. And uh, this is borrowing authority to, with an estimated maximum, and if it ends up being less, then uh, we don't have to borrow and expend the amount, but it is uh, a request to the council for authorization to an amount. Anything else from the committee or other members of the council who are present? Any public comment since we have a moment? Hearing none, then I'll take a motion to adjourn so we can all have a 10 minute break. I so moved. Second. Okay, um, all in favor of the motion to adjourn? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. And, I want to, and thank you both for coming. And the, count, the full council meeting will reconvene at 6.30. Um, all right, we're going to start by looking at, um, uh, excuse me, S seeing as how we have a majority of the councilors present, I call the regular meeting of the town council together at 6.30 on February 10th, 2020. Um, this agenda has kind of a mix and match uh, associated with it. Um, because we are starting with two hearings, and then we're actually going to move to, uh, I'm going to ask the council to suspend the rules, um, the rules of procedure on 8.4 for five different items. And the reason that I am asking for that is, and I've already spoken to uh, Councilor George Ryan, who's chair of GOL, about this. As I've looked at our agendas and tried to figure out how to make them not as lengthy and therefore not as long, although this agenda is certainly not a great example of that, um, I have observed that there are some things that are pretty routine. There are some things that are pretty, therefore also 
pretty straightforward. And there are some things that are should automatically or with council's approval be referred to standing committees or frankly their approval would facilitate the work of the council in the town. So um, we will get to that point at some point and if people do not want all of those to be part of this motion to suspend, we will do so. Otherwise, uh, we have two hearings tonight. Both are fairly straightforward. Uh, we'll be holding both hearings and then if we vote to close one or both of the hearings, we will then move directly to a vote to suspend the rules that I just talked about and then take action regarding each item discussed during the hearing. Our options at that point are to refer to GOL or move to grant permission regarding the request. So let me also mention the order of our agenda tonight is shown up here. We're actually going to start with, after I'm done with the announcements and this is the end of them, uh, we're going to start with the hearings, then we're going to go to action items 7A, 7B, 7G, and 7H. Uh, we will have general public comment after we finish those. We'll then go to proclamations and commemorations, and then presentations and discussions. After that, we will move back to the action items that are remain. We might take a break in there. Um, and when we complete the action items, although we will not be finished with the meeting, we will go into executive session and we will come back out and complete the rest of the agenda starting with appointments, et cetera. So without further ado, um, are there any questions from the council on the scramble of the agenda? Okay, then um, let's begin with the Verizon Petition, is there a Verizon representative here? Please come forward. <clears throat> Let me just say the hearing is now open. According to Mass General Law, Chapter 166, Section 22, it requires that the council hold a public hearing on a petition of any utility provider <coughs> to construct or locate poles, conduits, or underground wires for the transmission of electricity. This hearing is to consider a Verizon petition for, conduit located, for conduits located on Spring Street. Notice of the hearing was published on the town website and sent to a Butters. Um, you, the Department of Public Works recommends approval of Verizon's request. With that, could we see the schematic up there and would you please speak to your request? Uh, sure. Good evening. Uh, my name, for the record, my name is Paul Davis. I work for a company by the name of Pike Telecom. We're contract engineers for Verizon, and I am here tonight representing Verizon on their behalf in regards to the petition. Uh, the, the petition you see is on Spring Street, right outside here. Um, basically, what I was told was that the petition is for the right to utilize the existing conduit that was placed. Uh, on the petition by the town of Amherst approximately in the year 2008. Uh, Verizon is petitioning to occupy one conduit that was placed by the town. Um, very simply, the conduit is already in place. There are what they call handholes in the ground that are already in place. Uh, I believe that the work to be done is for the construction project out on Spring Street. And again, the petition is just petitioning for Verizon to have the right to occupy one of those existing conduit. Okay. Are there questions from the council? Dorothy? Well, these are uh, conduits that the town made, and I assume they made them for a reason, but they didn't change their mind, and they're empty now, or they're not going to need them later? Or, or is it one of these things where thousands of things can go in the same conduit? Well, the, the, the information that I was told last week when I talked, to, I talked to a gentleman um, that's managing the construction project out here. And he told me, again, that at one time the town wanted to beautify Spring Street, meaning they wanted to take the utilities and put them underground, take the poles out. So all the utilities would be underground, the poles would be removed, and you wouldn't see anything up in the air. 
So again, he told me it was around 2008 when this happened. Uh, the conduit again was placed underground with the, the handholds for the utilities to occupy. Um, and for whatever reason, he didn't give me a specific reason, but for whatever reason, the project stopped. And now they're, again, he's building the building there <clears throat> and they want to re-up the project again. And Verizon wants to place service on the road, either for the project or for future service. Mm -hmm. And again, to answer your question specifically, the conduit that Verizon is um, petitioning is just to be occupied by Verizon. One conduit, I believe there's four conduit in the ground. Um, so it would just be for Verizon's use only. Are there additional questions from the council? Mandy Jo. So I noticed on the plot plan, the poles say under the legend that they're to remain. Is that because Verizon is not the owner of those poles? And have we as a council, has, is Eversource the owner of them so that they'll come back later to petition to remove those? Or have we already agreed to, have we already granted a petition to remove those poles as these things move underground? That's as my first question. As far as I know, that is inaccurate, what we're looking at. As far as I know, the poles are to be removed. I just couldn't remember whether we'd already granted no. that or not. Thank you. Um, and Either. then I just have a request to the town manager. Yeah. Um, could you speak to Verizon so that they correct when they petition us that it says town council, not select board and board of selectmen? Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Andy. I don't know if you can answer this or if I have to, if this is one for Mr. Bachman, but uh, you had indicated that um, you thought that the conduits would be exclusively used by Verizon. And uh, we're going to be later in the evening discussing installation of an institutional network for a town-owned institutional network. And was there any use of the conduit anticipated for the INET? Mr. Rockman. So it, it could have been there. That's why there are four conduits. Typically, they're empty. When they repave a road, they'll, they'll place the conduits in so they can be used in the future, so you don't have to dig up the road and replace them. So the conduits are just basically alleyways that you can put wires through. So one would be for electric, one would be for Verizon, one would be for cable, and one spare, typically. Thank you. Are there other questions from the council? I, I just want to build Kathy, on that. Yes. Um, does that mean that we have no potential plan for the fourth conduit that they're adding, asking for? So it's not in any way, um, if we say a year from now, we would want to use it for something else? Because it, once it occupies that, it, it belongs to them, correct? And so the phone service for those lines will only be Verizon. Um, I mean, it, it will be a Verizon line that's running through correct. it. Correct, correct. So are there no potential alternative uses for it so it would otherwise just stay empty? I, I don't know in the future if there could be something else or if they could put a parallel line if they have to replace a line or something like that. Um, but there aren't many other utilities that, that put their equipment in the public way. Okay. Are there other questions from the council? Okay, then we move to questions from the public, not statements, but questions. Anybody with questions, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, is there anybody in here from the public who is here to speak in favor of this petition? Is there anybody from the public who would like to speak in opposition to this petition? Okay. Any further questions from the council? Dorothy. I know we discussed this before, but as far as the town of Amherst is, is concerned, this is a good thing, is that correct? Correct. The superintendent of public works recommends this. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Um, the council debate on the merits of the petition shall follow the vote. 
on a motion to close the evidentiary portion of the hearing. That will be later. Um, therefore, the hearing is now officially closed. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry? I'm up. All right. May, do we have a motion to close the hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Mandy Chair. All right, we're going to move on to the second hearing. This is a public hearing to consider a, a request from the owners of 35 South Pleasant Street, LLC, for a permanent change in the public way. Um, this building is otherwise known as the Visitor Center, the Chamber, and the BID. And we have with us tonight, Gabrielle Gould, Executive Director of the BID, and Mr. Roberts. How are you? Good evening. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm wearing maybe three hats tonight. I am the manager of 35 South Pleasant Street LLC, which owns the building uh, that houses J. Austin Jewelers, the bid, and one half of the stairway going up to the second floor. Um, I'm also the president of the Business Improvement District, and I'm on the board of directors of the Chamber of Commerce. The goal here is to make the visitor center handicap accessible, which it is, it is now because we have a temporary ugly metal ramp in front there. And the goal is to make sure that it stays within the storefront. Uh, as you may or may not have noticed, the temporary ramp that we have out there extends in front of Jay Austin's Jewelers. So if you were to grant us permission to do this, this ramp is slightly, very slightly steeper than allowed by code. We would approach the, A the Architectural Access Board in Boston and ask for a waiver, which we think Mr. Kuhn thinks we would be successful in getting. Um, in order to accomplish this and have the proper width and also a step, we need to go, we would propose to go on to the town the public way, the sidewalk, uh, for approximately uh, three and a half feet. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, we would like a permanent easement so that it can stay there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, Gabrielle has some comments about how much it's needed. <laughs> so technically and legally, we do not have to have a ramp into the visitor service center. But, and I'm speaking on behalf of Claudia and at the chamber as well as us at the bid, um, we cannot fathom being an inviting open storefront and um, information center if we are not handicapped accessible. The ramp that we currently have is, yes, incredibly unattractive and we have people come in on a regular basis and beg us to take it down, sometimes nicely, sometimes not nicely. Um, we are very aware that this has been a hindrance to J. Austin Antiques. Um, as everybody knows, they have one of the most beautiful windows over the holidays. You could barely see it because of the ramp. It is, um, it gets extremely icy and it's very hard to de-ice because it has rivets in it and it is very loud. And it also is harboring garbage and leaves, et cetera, underneath it, which is difficult to keep clean and maintain. This would increase the beauty of the street, which we all want to see, especially when we're right across from the North Common and the town building. And um, I know that Jeremy Austin has been incredibly um, kind to us, partly probably because he serves on our board, but he has mentioned that it has hindered his business, and I agree. I have also had several people come up in wheelchairs and say that it is impossible, our ramp is not friendly to them, and nor is the front door, which as you can see on this plan, would be a wider new front door for allowing handicapped accessibility to the building. Okay. Are there questions from the council? Andy. I have a couple things, but first of all, um, is the former select board liaison to the Disability Access Advisory Committee, I know that this was a big issue 
uh, Mr. Roberts came to DAC meetings that I attended um, as liaison, and uh, I very much appreciate your keeping after this so that we can get it resolved. Uh, I think that they were speaking for their responsibilities, and I um, appreciate your following up on it. So I have um, two questions. One is, um, has, do you, have you been back to DAC with this plan? And um, No, we have been nowhere with this plan other than to ask the town for, for this permission. If we go to, if you give us permission, we will go to the Disability Access Board. We will go to the Design Review. You know, we have to, and then ask uh, Rob Moore for a building permit. Right. Okay. And then the other question is, uh, uh, do you, I, I assume that uh, Kuhn Riddle has expertise and has, um, in the, the radius in front of the front door, is sufficient to allow people to um, maneuver once they're at the top of the ramp? Yes, if you look at the plan view that John Kuhn uh, drew, he shows the five-foot circle, which is required. It will require a automatic door opener because you can't come up to the, the door opens out, so it will uh, have an automatic opener that opens the door. Thank you. Additional questions, Shalini? This is just a recommendation that um, it's something that comes up all the time. Um, it's brought up by people with disability all the time that we're making decisions without including people with disability. So it's just a recommendation that um, to get the perspective, you know, when you get the, work through the design to get the perspective of people with disability if this is, if it, if it meets their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Dorothy? <coughs> Darcy. Darcy. She coughed. I called on her. Um, uh, I just am wondering if it's any requirement that the there be lighting of the stairway um, in the dark. There are already overhead lights in the alcove, if you will, that are on a timer that turn on automatically at night. So it will be there. It casts a glow. Okay. I don't, I'm just nobody's thinking. going to trip over it. Mm -hmm. That's that's my thought yeah. is that it will be sticking out into the public way and no. people will need to know it's there. There's pretty right. good street lighting right there. Okay. Um, Kathy. So I noticed the wording said permanent um, easement into the public way. If I look up at where it sits, um, my questions would be, suppose at some point in the future, this storefront becomes a restaurant. You know, it, it's an alternative use. Does that mean they can put tables there, um, move, move this structure um, is one part of the question. And then if I look at the buildings along there, I don't know how many others have a step. You know, it looked like the one just a little bit south also has a step to go up the, I guess it's yours, you have half the stairway. We've got one half of the step. You know, so, so what, I'm, it, what I'm getting at is how many of these might we start seeing in a place that has been uh, sort of treasured as a big wide open sidewalk so tables can go outside like at fresh side. It's, it's one of the uh, good aspects of our downtown that it's, it's got that nice public meeting place feeling to it. Mr. Bockelman, did you care to comment on any of that, or at this point, Mr. Roberts? I yield to him. OK, so the, the answer is no, they would not be able to use the ramp to put chairs on. And no, I don't think that they would be permitted that the town, if a restaurant went before the planning board and asked for outside seating, I don't. I, I would hope the planning board would say there isn't enough room to do it there. The step directly to the south leads up to a steep stairway, so there is no elevator in this building. So that the rest of the building is not handicap accessible. Okay, okay. Steve. 
I think the point is a good point, though. So despite the lack of an elevator in the next building, this actually is not what I was going to say, but despite the lack of the elevator in the next building, there may be someday. So it, in a sort of a coordinated response to this, like a more extensive almost front porch, you know, maybe something to, you know, to think about. My question was this. Now I forgot. My question was this. Um, we are here simply to approve an easement. We're not here to approve the design. So the design review That's board, correct. these other. Okay, so we're only approving basically the easement as shown on the, on the plan. That is correct. It's this is a starting. This starts with a request, uh, for a permanent change to the public way. That's our authority. The other authority goes to other committees. Are there other questions? Yes, Alyssa. Uh, two items. One is if we eventually get to the point where we move to do this, we had received a different draft language that said for the purpose of constructing, maintaining, repairing, and replacing a handicap access ramp and steps, which would also tend to tell me that that's what was authorized by the town manager eventually, that we authorize that he then executes. And so if somebody wanted to do something else with it, even though they'd got they'd gotten an easement only for that purpose, as opposed to an easement that is for what the I was other asking. purpose, and that's my understanding of partly why that wording is the way that it is. On a different note, um, following up on things that were said about DAC and design, I think that we might want to discuss at some point in the future whether or not we would like to see disability access weigh in on this before we do, because depending on what the state rules are, they actually don't have to be gone to. And so we can, people can say they're gonna go to, and I know you will, but if we wanna know, reflecting back to what Shalini said, what Andy said, I've been the liaison to DAC in the past too. If we wanna know that they feel like, yeah, this is getting to what they wanted, before it comes to us, that might be something we require in the future is that we have that information from them before we put it on our agenda. Okay. Mr. Bachman. So just to note that this, this originated with the DAAC asking the building owner to make this building accessible, especially since when the visitor information center was placed in there. And I think the building owner said, yes, that makes perfect sense and try and did a temporary fix knowing that he wanted a permanent fix. Uh, and that's what the, that's how this came out. It came about because the DAAC had initiated. I did speak with the chair of the DAAC in advance of this meeting and he was very pleased to see that the council was considering it. Okay. Any other questions from the council? Are there questions from the public? Are there um, any people from the public who would like to speak in favor of this petition? Are there any members of the public who would like to speak in opposition of this petition? Okay, any further questions from the council? Okay, we've debated this on the merits and we'll come to it later. Uh, could I have a motion to close the hearing? Mindy Jo. I move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? I second it. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? And it's 11 zero, zero, and two, and one, I'm sorry, it's 12 zero, zero, and one absent. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the rules of procedure. And let me just state that in the development of our rules of procedure, the committee recommended and the council adopted those rules on May 2nd, 2019. We've revised those rules on a regular basis all the way through January 6, 2020. Rule 8.4 is regarding discussion of measures. And it says, except for resolutions, proclamations, commemorations, citations, appointments, referrals, and emergency measures, the council shall discuss measures at a regular council meeting prior to the meeting on which the measure will be voted. The dis discussion need not include the specific language of the measure to be voted on, but shall include the substance of the measure. Um, 
So it's this very rule that we're asking to suspend and we're also asking GOL to look at. So, and the reason we're bringing it up now is because it applies to various actions that we're about to consider. Um, so, uh, the motion is to suspend Town Council Rule 8.4 for the following agenda items, um, or for, and for the motions associated with them. Um, it's 7A, the Verizon petition for conduits on Spring Street, 7B, 35 South Pleasant Street, LLC, request for permanent change to the public way, 7G, presidential primary election warrant, which is on March 3rd, 2020, 7H, Town Council Financial Orders, FY 2064, 65, 66, 67, 68, and 78, and Joint Capital Planning Committee and Budget Coordinating Group charges. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? No? Darcy? Could you just explain one more time why you want to suspend the rule? Because otherwise we have to bring this back for another agenda on a, on a subsequent agenda, and what I'm looking for is ways to cut our meetings back. Okay, so we just don't want to have a second reading of these items. We would not, unless we can also refer things to committees, we can also decide not to suspend for that particular item when we get to it. And we're going to do them individually? I, we can do that individually, yes. But I didn't want to have a vote to suspend each time we get to this item. Now, if that's what the wish of the council, we can do it that way. And just again, for instance, on the Verizon petition or even the 35 South Pleasant Street, we can vote to refer those. We can, you know, whatever. Same thing is true. Well, the presidential primary actually is in the category of emergency because we have to file that tonight. Uh, and the financial orders are a matter of, it would be helpful to proceed, and particularly on a couple of them, it's almost necessary. And on the joint capital planning and committee charges, those are modest changes to the charges. Alyssa. If, if I can just clarify then, it sounds to me, from the way you've explained it to us twice now, that by doing this just as a group and keeping all of them in there, we can make that motion, we can suspend the rule, and then as we get to each item, it doesn't prevent us from doing basically anything we want to do at that point. That's like correct. say, you know what, I think we need more on this, then we just keep That's going. Correct. But that way, this is a good start to getting okay. us in that more efficient world you were talking okay. about. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? And so it's, yes, one abstention. So it's 11, 0, 1, and 1 absent. Okay. So we're now going to move on to any, the act, potential action, in fact, action one way or another, with regard to the Verizon petition. And the two options are to refer the Verizon petition to Community Resources Committee for further discussion, and the other one is to grant the permission. Is there a wish of the council? Are you going to take Don't. motions? Yeah, oh, I, uh, motions. Uh, I move that we accept the proposal from Verizon. So, it's, yeah. It's the next page. Okay. I move to grant permission to Verizon New England Inc. to lay and maintain underground conduits and manholes with the wires and cables placed therein under the surface of Spring Street as recommended by the DPW and requested in the petition of said company dated the 12th day of December 2019, job number 4AOJ4KW. Is there a second? second? Any further discussion at this time? Yes. Um, what, what Mandy noted is that their request to us and the order for it says selectmen or select board repeatedly, so do we just get them to change that wording so it goes back into town council? 
because it's, it's, it's referring directly to the document we just read, the job 4A0J4KW. I'd like to ask the town, the clerk of the council to speak. Yes. We, we've voted a few of these for poll locations before, and I've just typed over town council and right. okay. fixed that, it that's before what I, I signed to know it. That we're, Thank we're, you. Eventually, people will catch on. Um, is there any other discussion or question? Yes, Evan. So uh, this isn't really either, um, but one thing I just wanted to bring, because I think this was initially built as sort of part of a Spring Street beautification idea, which I think is great. Um, one of the things we're doing as a council, as we've adopted um, sort of looking at things through the lens of climate change, moving utilities from above ground to below ground, um, in preparation for more intense storms and more frequent intense storms um, is actually also not just beautification, but it's also going to be a key part of building resilience and climate adaptation. Um, and so I want to say that because I think it's useful that we acknowledge that some of these projects aren't just fun little beautification things. They're actually really important things moving forward as we're going through lens of sustainability. Okay. Any further comment at this time? Okay, um, then we will move on the motion to grant permission to Verizon New England to lay and maintain underground conduits and manholes with wires and cables placed therein under the surface of Spring Street to, as recommended by the DPW and requested in the petition of, the, of said company dated the 12th day of December 2019, job number 4A0J4KW. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? 12-0-0 and one absent. Okay. We're going to move on to 7B. This is the request for the uh, change to the public way and a permanent way for the handicap accessibility. Our options, again, either are to refer to CRC, or which is the Community Resources Committee, or to authorize the town manager uh, to authorize the grant on such terms and conditions as the town manager deems appropriate, a permanent easement for the benefit of property located at 31 to 35 South Pleasant Street for the purposes of construction, constructing, maintaining, repairing, and replacing a handicap access ramp and steps on a portion of the public sidewalk abutting said property, which easement area is to be shown on a plan acceptable to the town manager. Is there a motion? Pat. No, just move is fine. Is there a second? Second. Um, is there further discussion? Okay. Then we'll move to a vote. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. I believe that was 12 zero, zero, and one absent. Okay. All right. Um, we are now going to go to item 7G. And this is in regard to kind of a standard thing that the town select board in the past and the town council now does, and that is to establish the warrant. Um, for the presidential primary. In this case, will be held on March 3rd, 2020. Um, we're doing this tonight, at which point uh, each counselor that is present will sign it, and it will be filed tonight as required by law. Are there any questions about that? Yes, Mandy Jo. How early can we do these? Like instead of waiting to the last minute, can we do some of the ones coming up in the fall in like July? <laughs> it's just a question I have. Shabina, please come forward. Shabina Martin is our town clerk, having joined us sometime in the last two months, I think. So that's a good question. So in a local election, yes, we can do them early. I have to wait to get the warrant from the Secretary of the State. And so they sent it at the end of 
January, and so this was the earliest that Athena and I could get it on the on the agenda. <laughs> You're welcome. It's the state process of hurry up and wait. Yes. Okay. Got it. All right. Anything else? Any other questions on this? All right. So this is a lengthy warrant. Would someone else like to read it and make the motion, George? I move to authorize the warrant for the presidential primary election on Tuesday, March 3rd, 2020, with uh, polls open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the following locations. Precinct 1, North Zion Church Hall, 1193 North Pleasant Street, Precinct 2, North Fire Station, 603 East Pleasant Street, Precinct 3, Emanuel Lutheran Church, 867 North Pleasant Street, Precinct 4, Large Activity Room, Bangs Community Center, 70 Boltwood Walk, Precinct 5, Large Activity Room, Bangs Community Center, 70 Boltwood Walk. Precinct 6, Fort River School, 70 Southeast Street. Precinct 7, Crocker Farm School, 280 West Street. Precinct 8, Munson Memorial Library, 1046 Southeast Street. Precinct 9, Wildwood School, 71 Strong Street. Precinct 10, Glass Room, Bangs Community Center, 70 Boltwood Walk. Is there a second? Seven. Okay. Any further discussion? Alyssa. Is this a school professional development day or is this one of the scenarios where we're having to hold an election in the school buildings just because that's been an ongoing conversation and now we have a new town clerk? That's a good question. Mr. Bachelman, do you know? Yeah. They, if, they, if it is not, I know from my, our own experience that we have certain restrictions placed on people polling and people standing outside, et cetera. Alyssa? While all that is absolutely true, there have been safety concerns raised by the schools around this when right. they aren't able to figure it out ahead of time. So I, I have the expectation that it's going to be discussed moving forward, not at this level necessarily, mm -hmm. but between the, the town manager and the town clerk and the schools. I, it's been an ongoing discussion, right. and now we have another town clerk that can be part of that ongoing discussion, and this is a statewide issue that just we yeah. live in a different generation. We all liked taking our kids to school to vote. That was amazing, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, and Mr. Bachman, I believe later you're going to talk about when the polls will uh, also be available for voting and also early voting. So yes? with Ms. Martin here, I think um, we can talk about early voting just to, to, since it's early in the meeting. Let's like, use the take, public mic to make that available now. Please. Take the opportunity to say that there will be early voting in town hall. Come on up, Shavina. Shavina, come on up. <laughs> well. So the, the town clerk has been working um, to make sure that we, for the first time, there will be early voting during the presidential primary. So, and uh, Ms. Martin can talk about that. And also, just as of very late this afternoon, we were able to reach agreement with uh, the university to have early voting at the university for the presidential primary. Do you want Terrific. To add? Sure. So, um, as town manager Bachman has said, so for the first time, the state legislator has passed uh, early voting for five days, which will begin February 24th through February 28th uh, in advance of the presidential primary. Um, we, are, we are required by law to have early voting here at town hall uh, during normal business hours, so that is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have it here at town hall those, four, those five days from 8 a.m. to 4.30. Um, Off-site locations are optional, and we did. Uh, just hours ago, we were able to come to an agreement with UMass. Um, we will be offering early voting on the three days, so Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 4 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., so that, that way students will also have the ability and faculty to early vote right on campus. And so uh, today is the deadline for many things, uh, in addition to the election warrant, as well as I have to get those locations, uh, the location um, at UMass, I have to get that submitted to the Secretary of Commonwealth by tomorrow. But we are excited for that. Um, 
Yeah, but the early voting locations don't require council approval. The they permit, do not. The permanent locations do. Correct. So mm -hmm. any any uh, changes to polling locations? I know Councilor Brewer did mention about schools. I was checking to see if it was going to be an in-service day. Um, though to change our standing polling locations, um, Mass General Law says that it has to take town council approval, um, and that also there's a timeline with that as well. So we are kind of outside of the window for moving polling locations for the upcoming March 3rd election. It also requires that wherever we wherever we choose to move a polling location requires notification to uh, voters in that area. So it's um, there's a lot of logistics um, and when the time comes we will definitely um, be in, in conversation with everyone. That's great. Mr. Buckman. And March 3rd is not a professional development day. Thank you for that information. So just be careful as you drive up to our schools Yes. Um, and any other place. Thank yes. you very much. You're welcome. There's Thank been you. a motion placed on the floor and seconded. Is there any further question or discussion? Alyssa. I just want to put in a plug of thanks to Ms. Martin and Mr. Bockelman for working on the early voting aspect. I worked on that with a previous town a couple of town clerks ago um, on the early voting in 2018, and it was really valuable. And I realize it's a relatively short window, but that's based on the students' input. Right. That's when they said it would be useful to them. And so I think this will be, and of course, it's not in the student union because that's not there right now. But um, I think it'll be a really good baseline for us for mm -hmm. thinking about the future. And you know, she had to like turn on dime to do this in terms of making all these arrangements. So Great. thank you for going to that extra effort. Okay, and you're going to provide us with a warrant that we can pass around and sign? Athena uh, is going to do that, okay. Any further questions or discussion at this time? And then I'm calling the question. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12-0-0 and one absent. Uh, we are going to move on to the financial orders while we're signing this. It's your, s Sorry. that's okay. Sonia Aldridge is going to take us through that along with Andy Steinberg, who is chair of our finance committee. Okay. All right, um, the first is uh, order 2064, and this is a housekeeping order. Um, we are repurposing funds that we appropriated for the Station Road Bridge. We um, replaced the bridge with a temporary for a lot less than we anticipated. And we, there's some work that needs to be done in North Amherst on the intersection of North Pleasant Pine and Meadow Streets. So we'd like to repurpose what's remaining in that fund of um, 116919 so that we can use it to repair these, the um, intersection, the traffic signals there, and to use whatever's left to repair roads and sidewalks in that area. So just okay. repurposing an already. Okay. So the motion before us is, in terms of council order FY 2064, an order appropriating funds for general road and sidewalk improvements, including traffic signals, at the North Pleasant Pine Meadow Street intersection as recommended by the 21020 Finance Committee report. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion or questions? Yes, Darcy. Um, in District 5, we recently had our district meeting and the, the topic was um, different areas that need um, sidewalk repair, different issues around traffic and safety. And I'm just wondering, how was the decision made to put this money into one particular project as opposed to, for example, all of our projects in District 5? Mr. Bachman. So the traffic lights have been identified as a priority for the town, and we just never had the funds. The DPW engineers came up with a relatively um, um, inexpensive solution. It's not going to look really attractive, but it will 
help us navigate traffic through that complex intersection. So it's always been an issue for us. It won't use all the money, so there will be other funds available, as we said, because for general road and sidewalk improvements. So it allows us to use, use that money that's being transferred for other purposes as well. Darcy? Um, that doesn't exactly answer the question, though. I'm just interested in knowing what the process is for prioritizing different projects around town, of which we have many. We have many possible projects. So how, how are they prioritized? Mr. Balkman. So they, the town engineers look at the need for the, the demand by the public for public safety issues. Um, and so it's probably it's public safety is the first issue. And so in North Amherst at that intersection, there have been a number of situations where the pole, there have been accidents and the poles have been taken out. Uh, there's also traffic congestion in that area. And we try to be responsive to the areas that need, it, need the funds the most, uh, most urgently. Mr. Steinberg. Yeah, I would add to that that um, over a number of years uh, that go back, I believe, prior to Mr. Bachman being our town manager, we had applied for MassWorks grants for that intersection because it has been a part of a whole circle that includes the area north where um, Montague Road and Sunderland Road split just before the North Amherst Library, and that that has been um, a high priority of the town for a long period of time. We have been unsuccessful in obtaining the MassWorks grants, but uh, in, when I looked at this, I said, oh, we're finally getting um, to what has been a high priority item for the last 10 years, and uh, I think that was part of probably the analysis. Alyssa. Uh, following, thank you, Andy, because I remember it the same way, except the interesting thing to me is that when we asked about it a couple town managers ago, we were told it was going to take over $200,000 to fix this intersection even to this level. And so we kept being told, no, we don't have the money, we don't have the money. Well, now you can see it's less than 116, and so engineers continue to come up with clever ways of doing things that perhaps did not exist five years ago when we had that conversation more than once back then. And so I think Darcy does bring up a good point, though, in terms of like an ongoing basis, sort of affiliated with the capital plan and all our facilities and everything else is Andy and I know that because we've been doing it a long time. Somebody who's been in town meeting might remember we were talking about it for a long time. But how do people know right now what our priority list and what are the things that have been hanging on those lists that we all keep hoping money appears for? So I, maybe they're, you know, maybe that's a retreat topic or, or someone has a proposal for how we can keep track of that so kind of everybody knows what the priorities are and that were established some years ago and that might need some town council input at some point. But I don't think it changes this particular project because not only, A, do I live in that area, B, I know it's a longstanding concern and we're thrilled that some reasonably cost intersection improvement can be made. Dorothy. Well, I am newer to town council, but when we at the very beginning were asked to replace the Station Street uh, Bridge, I know that a lot of people were saying, wait, wait, the North Amherst intersection, wasn't that supposed to happen next? And it, we were told that we couldn't because the state had not accepted our plan yet and it was a matter of money. But that it, so I had the understanding that that was on the list as one of the next things that really had to be done. Um, but you're right, we don't really have a formal list and you know, maybe we do need to have one. Um, Andy. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to one thing that uh, Ms. Brewer said, and that was uh, about the cost. Uh, as uh, Mr. Mooring described the project that's proposed uh, when he met with the Finance Committee, um, he indicated that uh, this was going to be a much simpler approach than had been previously anticipated involving uh, traffic lights that essentially would be by wire hung over the intersection as opposed to on poles because we don't have the funds to do the complete work that needs to be done. 
Um, one of the issues is that the poles, as Mr. Bachman indicated, are very close to the intersection corners, and um, as trucks or in large vehicles um, make the turn and uh, make it too sharply and take out the poles, it causes uh, the traffic signals to be out for weeks at a time. Um, and uh, so it was uh, really, at this point, not intended to be the permanent solution. Um, the one additional thing that we asked at the Finance Committee was, um, is this then an investment that we can't use in the future? And uh, Mr. Mooring's reply was absolutely not, that the um, switching equipment and the light standards themselves would be usable at this or future intersections and that there's nothing that we're investing in in the way of electronic hardware that would not be usable far into the future. This is just one of the oldest uh, existing traffic lights in town and uh, cannot be solved without putting in new electronics. Kathy? Um, I, and I, I wanted to add, I mean, one of the interesting things that has come up in the last several months, because I, I have a memo that's like six years old with the town commitment to do this light, and it said next summer, so it never happened, but that uh, it's going to be hung, so the description is they won't be pretty, but there's new equipment that can count pedestrians and bikes as well as cars. So we'll get a much better sense of what the flow through this intersection is as the big apartments open up and get f full for future planning on what to do with that intersection. So it's, it's doing two things at once. It's pro potentially alleviating delays. And as Dor Dorothy mentioned, when Station Bridge came up and people were talking about 10 minute delays, we're going, that's a daily experience at this intersection you know, at different times of days, you know, where you had to do the roundabout. So what's going to be interesting about this is the information we can get out of this installation in addition to see, does it ease up or not having the left-hand turn signal, or do we need to do more? So uh, the creative part here was not permanent poles suck underground with wires underneath, but strung across the street suddenly made it much cheaper. Further question? Comment? Yes, Pat. Um, um, it's come. One of the goals for the town manager is to create a list of priorities, and I, I know that you will do that, uh, but I'm encouraging it because I remember when we first became a council, we had concerns um, about the DPW's process and the ordering of what gets done in town when. Um, I've had lots of residents uh, on Stanley Street talk about things that haven't been done and things on Lincoln and Amity and everything else gets done much more quickly. Um, and we really need that, and we need Mr. Mooring to participate in that process and not try to control the process. Uh, specifically, let me mention that under the town manager's goals just adopted in our last meeting is 3B2, which is to develop a plan that balances Competing needs for investments, roads, sidewalks, building maintenance, technology, equipment, vehicles, <coughs> municipal facilities, such as parks, athletic fields, et cetera. So I think we understand that. Mr. Yes, Ross, Evan. Uh, so I, I actually have uh, no issue trusting our fairly expert staff, engineers, Department of Public Works to decide which our priorities are. Um, and I actually have no interest in seeing their list of priorities and telling them that the priorities in my district should be higher than the priorities in a different district. Um, so I hope that when the town manager is accomplishing that goal, um, it doesn't feed into some type of district interfighting. My question is something different because I have no issue with this project and I think that it's, it is a, it's a recognized town need. I have driven through that intersection. I have, what's worse, biked through that intersection. Um, and so I, I understand that and I'm fully supportive. What, I, what I'm a little confused about and I would like some clarification on is um, if this has been such a priority project, why has it not been a part of our long-term capital plan? Why has it not been in the capital improvement program? It feel, this feels very much like, oh, we got some free money because something cost less. Where can we spend that? Here's a priority. And so I guess to me, the 
if, if we appropriate money, especially from free cash to a project, and that project comes in under budget, I would like to see that money go back into free cash. I think we need to be really protecting our free cash and stabilization fund. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm a little curious to hear the decision about not returning this to free cash and spending it on this and why the decision was to use this money as opposed to building it into capital the way we do other road imp and infrastructure improvements. Mr. Bachman. So there are two reasons. One is that this intersection wasn't prioritized because we were seeking grants over multiple years because we wanted a comprehensive solution for not just this intersection, but also the intersection with Montague Road and Sunderland Road and the entire, that entire area of North Amherst. So that was the first attempt and that we tried to, multiple times to get um, grants for the MassWorks grant. So that didn't, those didn't come through. Um, subsequent to that, fairly recently, the town engineers came up with a solution that was not with large um, um, poles that were very expensive, but with wooden poles that could be sunk in the ground and, and at a relatively low cost, not putting in conduit underneath this, the streets where you had to tear it up and put, hanging the wires. And that's why we call it, kind of call it the not most attractive solution, but it'll be effective, we think. Um, so it's uh, when, and this buys us time until we get to a permanent solution there. Uh, the question is to whether um, this fund, these funds should go back to the free cash or not. That's up to the council. We recommend since money, this money had already been set aside for road work um, for this uh, station road bridge and it felt like the council had already determined that that was a useful, a, a use for these, these funds and weren't looking at specific by project by project and that was the, the logic for moving this forward. Steve? So Mr. Ro uh, Evan, um, I agree with what Evan's saying that this seems like a really weird way to budget because we had a special, we actually had a special town council meeting for this emergency for the station road bridge. And that was the purpose of the allocation is for this emergency, the station road bridge. And certainly it was my expectation at that time that if it would cost less, then the money goes back to where it came from, not to another project. So this project sounds urgent. It sounds like there are all kinds of other urgent projects, but it's not the emergency for which we allocated the money. So we wouldn't, in our households, hopefully budget this way. So I don't think the town should be budgeting this way either. So, so I think it's a completely needy project, but I think it should be considered as part of the regular budgeting process, not as a special reallocation of money that was set aside for a completely different purpose. Are there other questions or comments? Shalini? So, <clears throat> referring to Mr. Ross's comment, I just want to say that at least I really trust, um, I do trust the employee, uh, the town employee's decisions as you mentioned, but I think it's, and they often have very good reasons for why they're prioritizing what it is, and I think what's missing is the transparency or an explanation given to people why. So what Darcy was saying, uh, I think it's more about the transparency piece that, you know, just letting people know why these decisions are being made. And regarding this particular decision, I do remember in our um, finance committee meeting when we were deciding the Station Road Bridge that this, um, the North, uh, this intersection came up and it was, of, uh, many people were struggling with that. and. And I think uh, Mr. Bockelman just provided us a reasoning why we are doing it in this particular way, and I agree that we should go ahead with it as an exception. I would like to mention that we did something similar when we bought a school bus. We took extra transportation money that was in the schools, and we reallocated it for a bus. Um, not to bring up the bus again, but just to say we've done that kind of action in the past. Uh, Andy. Uh, just here where I looked at the uh, capital plan as we were meeting just now. Um, and North Amherst intersection and streetscape are in the capital plan for FY21 at $2.1 million. It was uh, with the grant funding. Um, we don't know if the grant will come through, but this has been in, uh, an identified and placed in the capital plan priority. And I believe town meeting actually put forward money for a study of, of that intersection, I don't know, three years ago, something like that. 
Uh, any further discussion on this? All those in favor, the motion's been made and seconded. It requires only a majority vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. So we have one opposition, one abstain. So it's 11, no, it's 10, one, one, and one absent. Okay, we're moving on to financial order 2065. Okay, again, this is another housekeeping order. We talked about this a little bit earlier this evening, and it's um, authorizing the town to apply premiums from pr prior borrowing authorizations before we go into permanent bonding. So, like I said, if we borrow a million dollars and we get a premium of 100000 we would only permanently borrow 900 We would put this towards that. Okay. So um, the motion is the following. In terms of council order FY 2065, an order authorizing bond premiums from past borrowings to be applied to reduce existing debt as recommended by the 21020 Finance Committee report. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Second? Second. Discussion or question? Under Andy, did you want to speak to this? No, I think the uh, Finance Committee report was written to provide the explanation. Okay. Further discussion or questions? All right, then call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. So I guess that was 1200. Okay. Uh, financial order 2066. Another housekeeping. This is a transfer um, excess free cash over 5% of the operating budget revenues into the stabilization fund. This has been a practice um, that we follow, which is part of our current financial management policies, that anything over 5% of free cash would be moved into stabilization fund for long-term um, planning. Okay. We have uh, free cash was certified at 6.7 million. We are moving approximately 2 point, almost 2.6 million from free cash to stabilization. The net um, effect is zero. It's just going from one pot to the other. Stabilization is available where free cash goes away June 30th. The reason it's so much that we're moving is because we repaid the $2 million from the that we borrowed from free cash for the Health Claims Trust when we were, uh, was it a couple of years ago at town meeting? That got repaid sooner. So that falls to our fund balance and goes to free cash. It won't be this big every year. Okay. Um, the uh, motion, motion that reads as follows in terms of Council Order FY 2066, an order appropriating transferring funds from free cash to stabilization, stabilization fund as recommended by the 210 20 Finance Committee report. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion or questions? Call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Moving on to financial order 2067. Another housekeeping item. This is uh, will be the final order we'll have like this. Uh, when we were self-insured, our Medicare D premiums would get transferred to the OPEB trust fund. It, it comes in as, free, as um, general fund revenue and it falls to free cash and then we have to appropriate from free cash to move it into the OPEB. And this is the final adjustment. Okay. And so the motion on this is in terms of council order FY 2067, an order appropriating and transferring funds from free cash to OPEB trust fund as recommended by the 21020 Finance Committee report. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any further question or discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay, now we're moving on to the one that we just had a finance committee meeting on. 
So the first one is Order 2068, and that is regard to the schools, correct? Correct. Okay, please go ahead. So this is an art, this is a two thirds vote that's required, and it's an order authorizing the borrowing for 750,000 for an elementary school feasibility study. I think I need to okay. More than that. As I, we explained earlier, the original amount that we had put aside in the FY20 budget was 400,000. Uh, based on the estimate from Mass School Business Authority, we actually are now estimating this at 750,000. That may at some point re be reduced, but you have to upfront the money from the beginning. So the order reads in terms of count town council in terms of council order FY 2068, an order appropriating and approving borrowing for a portion of the town of Amherst FY 20 capital program elementary school feasibility study as recommended by the finance committee 210-2020. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. All those, yes, Andy? Just on a report for those of you who weren't in the room, the finance <laughs> committee um, met again this evening between the uh, public forum and this meeting and voted unanimously to recommend this motion. Okay. Is there any further question? Call the question. Is there a change? Mr. Bachman. So, so there's more detailed language that the Finance Committee reviewed, I believe, uh, that mentioned MSBA and things like that? Yes, there is. Um, I think that is what the motion has to be. Athena, could you put that up? And it's the uh, town, town Council Order FY 2068. And at the time we discussed this earlier, um, Sonia, uh, Ms. Aldrich um, indicated that there was additional language added, and would you explain why? Um, the additional language added was so that we would be in compliance with MSBA reimbursements. We, we were first told that we wouldn't be getting, we wouldn't um, be getting a reimbursement for this, but there's a chance that we might, <clears throat> some of the things might qualify, so we wanted to put all the MSBA language in here so that we didn't have to come back and redo another article later on on that. And the other language that's in here is um, allowing us to use the premiums to pay down the debt before we go to okay. permanent bond. So could we have a withdrawal of the original motion? Sure. <laughs> yes. All right. So the motion in this case is the one you see before you, and we're not going to try to read it uh, since we've looked at it twice tonight. Is there a motion? George and the second? I second it. Dorothy? Any further discussion? Andy? I just should mention now that uh, uh, Superintendent Morris is um, still in conversations with uh, Mass School Building Authority about um, whether this um, order meets all of their required terms. Um, we um, believe the answer should be yes, but obviously we're not MSBA. And if they require a change in the motion, we will have to come back at a subsequent meeting and amend the order. Is that correct, Mr. Bachman, mm -hmm. if I stated right? Mr. Bachman. That's accurate. So what, um, what the superintendent reported is that given the failed vote previously, the town should not count on any reimbursement. However, after the schematic design process is complete, the MSBA will review expenditures to see if any of them can be considered for reimbursement but there is no um, explanation from MSB, MSB on how they would make that determination. So we okay. felt like putting this language in gave us the opportunity to receive grants uh, without delaying the project. Okay, any further discussion? Questions? Hearing none, all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. 12 zero, zero. Great. Moving on to the INET. Uh, 2078. Again, this is a borrowing authorization which requires a two thirds vote, and this is appropriating um, 589,000 for the installation of an institutional network loop. 450,000 of this um, debt service will be paid with um, 
funds from Comcast. The rest is, will most likely be paid from um, water and sewer fund for projects that they're doing with that. Okay, and uh, the fiscal order that you see up on the screen is actually the motion as it's required. And it also was voted and recommended by the Finance Committee, committee meeting, which was held earlier this evening. Is there a motion, please? You can just say, I move in order of. Aunt, so, Mandy Jo. So moved on that <laughs> Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. 12-0-0. We are now going to move on to general say, public comment. Did you say anything about the wording of future orders? Did you um, yes, let me use the opportunity while we're moving on to public comment um, to first of all ask those of you that plan to make public comment to make sure that you have registered in the back. And second of all, I just want to mention that we've gone through quite a discussion recently um, among a few council members as to the need and therefore the inclusion of whereas clauses in financial orders. And we have made adjustments to those orders that we've just looked at and removed the whereas, but in the future, either in the finance committee report or in a cover memo, the necessary background to understand the issue will be included, okay? Any further question on that? All right. Then. I, yes, Dorothy. Just a question. Where was that decided? The there, whereas uh, conversation. Where did the whereas conversation take place? And It took place between Councillor Brewer and myself and Councillor um, Steinberg. And I think that might have been it. Yes. yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Ms. Aldrich did a lot of research on our behalf after Ms. Brewer raised this question, and uh, there were a um, number of cities that have orders that have the kind of detail that um, explains the reasoning for the um, order. There were some that do not. There were some cities that depended upon what order they were providing. Um, but it was quite clear that it's not required. Um, what the reasoning was, um, and if you, if, if you um, have concerns about it, then I think we should find a mechanism to have the discussion. But what the thought was is that the Finance Committee report is in the same packet, and that the explanation of the uh, orders that are recommended by the Finance C Committee should be explaining what would be in a whereas clause if you were providing a whereas clause, and therefore it was not necessary to do both. There was a little bit of thought about whether there should be all in one document so that in the future, if people looked at documents and looked at orders, they could see the reasoning for the order in addition to the actual order itself but um, in this day and age with electronic packets where it's all bundled together, um, that didn't seem to be um, as urgent as it might have been uh, many years ago when orders were first created. So rather than get into the question of what was, um, whether these whereas clauses were serving that purpose or not, um, it seemed that this resolution was one to um, attempt and uh, if there is strong feeling that um, this should be revisited then I would suggest that um, it be referred to an appropriate committee for further discussion. Kathy. I, I just want to add if you, if you go back and look at some of the whereas clauses we were getting with these orders they did very little to explain the order. They said, we're the town council, we have the authority to do it. You know, it was a series of things that you had to read. And so it's, it will be much better to have a, this will do the following, 
and this is why we need it with these kinds of orders rather than put a lot of boilerplate in. And going back and reading some of the whereas clauses, that's not quite right. And we don't want to have to wordsmith the whereas clause. We would rather focus on the order, so it's going to be cleaner. But we may well need um, explanatory memos coming to finance um, because we're also trying to pick it up verbally and then represent it and check it back. But just a, what is this for and why, so we can refer to, you know, uh, uh, rationale. Okay. Yes, Dorsey. Uh, I would just say I would look forward to a discussion uh, in the whole council about the value of whereas clauses. Um, because I, I, uh, I think there's some feeling about them that they aren't valuable, and I could see where sometimes they are not, and that they are boilerplate, but sometimes they uh, are a valuable introduction or explanation of what it is that is being uh, requested. Uh, so noted, and I will make sure we look at that in the future. Okay. Um, we are now moving to public comment. General public comment on matters other than those under agenda item 6A, which is flood mapping, is welcome. Uh, residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the town council president. Based on the number, I might reduce that. Uh, the council will not engage in dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. Please make, please make sure that when you are asked to come forward, you state your name and where you live, and also that you've signed in. Who would like to speak to public comment at this time? Come forward, please, sir. Good evening. Please make sure the mic is on. I believe the mic's on. It's on. Hi, my name is Jim Barna. I'm a resident of Amherst. I live at 34 Dana Place. <clears throat> Excuse my, my voice. Um, I'm here tonight to just uh, comment on the Lincoln Street parking changes. Um, I walk Lincoln Street twice a day, every day, and um, I see it as a street where public resources are being used well. This is a hard town to park in, and the people that park on that street are the workers and the students who are all residents of this town, and um, it's a vital resource that is being taken away. Now, the town manager's report is going to show us, uh, I believe, that um, there's been no discussion about the implications of that change on the people that park there, um, nor uh, any indication of where the town is going to replace that parking. This is a public resource. It should not be stripped away at will. Um, that street looks pretty safe to me as I walk it every day. Um, it has uh, 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 barriers to stop people from driving fast. Um, and there are other ways to deal with this parking issue other than just stripping parking or limiting it to a, a span of time that will make it unusable for people at work and, uh, and frequent the university. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Additional public comment at this time. Please come forward. Hi, Rebecca Hall. Rebecca Hall, Stony Hill Road. Um, first of all, I want to let everyone know that there's been a couple of bills that have been passed in Massachusetts favorably just last week. One is Bill S-129, which reported favorably um, and it's to form a commission to investigate the health and economic impact of wireless radiation. The other bill that passed favorably is S-1988, the right to choose non-radiation or Wi-Fi emitting utility meters. These are important decisions statewide that will affect every town in Massachusetts, and I think Amherst needs to consider this in regard to their uh, wireless water meters and also in regard to learning what exactly we're facing from these health and environmental hazards. Since the council is in charge of making decisions about 
telecommunications for Amherst. And since 5G uh, will be knocking at our door at some point from one of these companies, I think it's important that the council become educated about what 5G means. And last week I showed a film at the Senior Center and I invited the entire council, I invited many members of town politic, town um, employees to come to this film and not a single person came. We had a really good turnout at the Senior Center, but no town employees. I'd like to offer a showing of the film again and I'm gonna describe it. It's called Generation Zapped. It won Best Documentary at the DC Independent Film Festival, the Women's Film Festival, and was selected for the United Nations Association Film Festival as well. Schools are beginning to show it. It's also screened at public libraries, town halls, university churches, and other community venues around the world, including at the Massachusetts State House, uh, the NIH, and Google headquarters. Um, if you're willing to show this film, I bought the copyrights, I bought the DVD and the copyrights, and I'm happy to bring it to whatever location and time you want me to, to educate, help educate and inform our council members as to exactly what this means. So it's an offering I'm making to the town and I really hope you take me up on it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, who else would like to make public comment? Sir, back here. Please come forward. I'm just kind of working my way across the room. Hi, Nick. Hi. How are you? Hi, I'm Nick Seaman from the Black Sheep. Uh, for the last 34 years, I'm here to speak about the issue of parking and redesi redesign for the North Common. Um, parking is the lifeblood of any downtown. I've been on two boards of the Chamber of Commerce. I started the Main Street Association. I helped start and was first president of the PDA, standing for promoting downtown Amherst. I spent six years on the Parking Commission and six years on the Town Commercial Relations Committee. I probably know as much about parking in downtown as all of you combined. 25 years ago, the planning department, planning department did a study that determined that the downtown was short about 350 spaces. After years of fighting, the result was the Boltwood parking thing, an underground, undersized, and overpriced parking lot adding about 90 spaces. Since then, the town has seen a tremendous increase in parking demand. The Amherst Cinema opened with 300 seats. Numerous new restaurants have opened. Numerous traditional retailers closed and were changed into higher customer count restaurants. At the same time, the town has consistently worked to lessen the number of parking spaces. They created crosswalks, jut outs, loading zones, and due to questionable zoning policies of development, the elimination of many parking spaces. For example, the new, par the new apartment building on the site of the carriage shops eliminated 40 public parking spaces. The result is, of course, we have less parking now in downtown than we did when the park Boltwood parking thing was opened. Years ago, the argument against any new parking was that if all all of the existing spaces were not full 100% of the time, then we did not need any more parking. Using that same logic, if 100% of the pedestrian spaces, the Common, Sweetser Park, Kendrick Park, the pedestrian, the pedestrian spaces in the Boltwood parking thing, and the North Common, if they are not full 100% of the time, then we do not need any more of it. When does anyone not have enough park space in Amherst to use and enjoy? The business community needs every parking space we can get. Losing any spaces in the North Common lot is totally unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Additional comments at this time. Uh, let me take the gentleman right here in the front. Hold on. And you're next. No, I, Which please, one? you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Julian Hines, 54 High Street. I would like to inform the council in regard to the public way rec regulations on Lincoln Avenue, that it's not just Lincoln Avenue. Um, I agree that Lincoln Avenue has a parking problem. However, I think it's many other streets as well. I notice I live on High Street, and we have a problem where cars park right up to the corner of Taylor Street and make it very difficult 
for someone to go around that corner, almost impossible for a school bus to go around that corner. I'd be concerned to s if a fire truck or something like that ever had to go around the corner. And since I walk to school every day, I notice that <clears throat> oftentimes I have to go out into the middle of my street to see if anyone's coming before I actually cross the street because they are parked so close to the corner. On C Click Fix, which is a app that the DPW uses, some of you may be familiar with it. Um, Kendrick Place, uh, which is on that side of downtown, um, there was a issue about them having parking people parked on both sides of the street, so it was very difficult for the an auto body shop to get their wrecked cars in and out. So I would like to inform the council that it's not just Lincoln Avenue. We should approach this as a town-wide problem um, and a downtown-wide problem rather than just uh, Lincoln Avenue because the residents of Lincoln Avenue came here and wanted to see something. Um, we should rather be approaching this from the perspective of all our streets in the downtown area need some improvement or some thought on this issue. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Sir, please come forward. And we understand your daughter will be joining you. Yeah. Hi, good evening, everyone. I, uh, because English is my second language, I let my daughter speak to me for about a parking lot. Thank you. Hi, I'm from 39 South Pleasant Street. I strongly disagree to remove the parking play space to build a playground because the parking is already being a big problem in downtown of Amherst. People have to take a long time to drive around to look for a parking space. And I, th I, and I, don't, I don't know if the other restaurants noticed that, but ever since they changed the parking meter, people have to pay until 8 p.m. instead of 6 p.m. The downtown of Amherst is so quiet at 9 p.m. Our customers stop to come at 7 7.30 p.m. and 8 p.m. The restaurant is empty 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. It's supposed to be the most busiest time during the day for the restaurant. Building a restaurant and decorating, building a playground and decorating the park can, this can attract more people to come to the town. But you, but you know, those people who want to come to the park to spend time are usually taking the parking space a lot more than t the people who want to come to the town to eat and shop. People only like to come to the park at the nice and sunny days, but we need the park and parking spaces every day. The parking space is very important to the businesses in town. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for both of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Additional comments, please. Gabrielli. Uh, Gabrielle Gould, downtown Amherst bid. Um, I'm sorry that Nick left because I would have liked to have set this in front of him as well. Um, the bid is very encouraged about the North Common um, being redone and beautified. We, we look at it every day. We hear from people that it is an incredible disrepair and an eyesore. Um, we are also doing our own due diligence, running around town with tape measurers and things like that. And I think that there is an opportunity to look at the spaces being removed from the common and easily replace them with some restriping, et cetera. I also want to make it clear publicly that um, a five-part destination Amherst was presented a couple of weeks ago and that one of the items on that is the idea or the concept of a parking garage, um, not to be confused with a parking 
parking thing, um, but a parking garage. And um, I, I think that we need to do a little bit more due diligence on my part to get together with more of our community members and probably using a translator as well so that we have open communication with some of our business owners. But I did want to make it clear that I think that there are solutions that can benefit our businesses and our greater community. And I do believe that the beautification of downtown benefits our greater businesses as a whole. Thank you for your comment. Is, are there any other public comments at this time? Okay. Then we are going to move on to proclamations and commemorations. And I would just like to note that we have several women voters in the room. Um, Adrian, you might like to come forward. And uh, Mandy Jo, you are presenting this proclamation. Yes, thank you. So this is a proclamation celebrating the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters of the United States. The council may remember that um, a couple months ago, we passed a citation celebrating the League of Women Voters of Amherst's 80th anniversary. And so this is a follow-up to that to celebrate the full United States' League's 100th anniversary. So Adrian had asked us to sponsor it. So take it away, Adrian. Please come forward and sit. And if you have something to pass to the council, you actually give it to Athena. Thank you very much. I want to thank the council for acknowledging the National League. Uh, Amherst League is 80, almost 81 years young. But I wanted to come forward tonight along with my steering committee members and some league members whom I invite to join me up here. Um, February 14th, 1919 is the establishment, the formalized founding of the League of Women Voters. And I'd like to point out that it was six months, well, several months before the 19th Amendment was passed. So this year, the League is really celebrating, commemorating both our centennial and the centennial that gave women the right to vote. I'll be brief, but I did want to tell you how the Amherst League is going to be participating in this Friday's National Day of Action. We've chosen a National Day of Action here in Amherst as a kickoff launch to the Get Out the 2020 Census Count Campaign in Amherst. So I'll pass these around to all of you. I've left some at the back of the room. So on February 14th, 11 to 1, you'll find us downtown. We'll be wearing our sashes and our buttons, and as you can see, some of my friends have the original suffragist uh, dress on. We will be handing out our cards, our literature, so that we can get people to not only be aware, but to tell them that every, every person counts. And we want to lose the position we hold. We don't no longer want to be among the 10 hardest towns to count in the Commonwealth. So we are going to join the efforts of the town and our collaborative organizations and continue thereafter. February 14th is our kickoff, but we've joined with the Jones Library and with the Senior Center, Mary, Anna, uh, Mary Beth Ogilevitz, who are welcoming us to host information sessions as well as help sessions. So we thank you for acknowledging the National League. The work of the Amherst League continues. We started with the right for women to vote, and we continue to support voting rights for everyone. And we continue to educate, advocate, and and impact legislation at the local, state, and national level. So I'll end by saying thank you very much, Town Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and supporting our work. Thank you for your time on behalf of the steering committee and the members of the Amherst League of Women Voters. And I have a little gift for you. It is our 100th. I will pass it out. Now, Copy of the, the U.S. Comp I will. US Constitution. Uh, wow. Residents can get their copies at the reference desk at the Jones Library. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you, and thank you for all the work that the League does on behalf of the town and our voters, and especially thank you for helping with the 
complete count effort in Amherst. Uh, is there motion? The motion is, and Joe? I'll move to adopt the proclamation celebrating the 100th anniversary of the League of Women Voters of the United States as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? George? JOL met on January 29th and declared this to, act, to be clear, consistent, and actionable. Okay. Unanimously. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? It is 12, one, one, 12 zero, zero, and one person absent. Thank you. Yes, Pat. I, I just wanted to say I'm totally excited about this anniversary, uh, but I want us to think about the African American women who helped get the suffrage, helped get the vote, and then were denied the vote. Um, and that really, it wasn't until the Voting Act, Rights Act of 1965 that people of color in the United States began to have the vote. And as you know, those rights are being dismantled all over the United States. Um, so we're not done, and we need to fight in a uni unified way now. Thank you. And join us in our attempt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a quick five-minute break at this time and then reconvene. All right. We're moving on to a presentation on flood mapping. And um, that does have additional time for public comment if anybody is interested. And I just want to note that Christine Brestrip, our planning director, will be making that presentation. This is an issue that later will come before the council for a vote with regard to the flood insurance rate maps. And so listen up now, and then it'll come back to us at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about our flood mapping project. Some of you have seen this before, but others, for others it might be new. I prepared a lengthy memo for the town manager on this topic, and that was included in your packets, mm -hmm. so I won't go into too much detail tonight. This is a first look at the flood mapping project. There will be at least two more public presentations to town meeting with representatives from our consultants, as well as our IT department, to give you more detailed technical information and allow you to ask technical questions. Eventually, you'll be asked to vote to adopt the new flood maps, the new flood study, and a set of zoning amendments to accompany them. The town of Amherst is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is administered by FEMA. This program provides subsidized flood insurance for property owners whose properties lie within the 100-year floodplain. The adoption of new maps and accompanying zoning regulations requires the vote of the town council. That vote needs to occur sometime in the next six to nine months. The town has been working on this project of updating the flood insurance rate maps and the flood insurance study since around uh, 2012. The purpose of the project is to create accurate, federally approved maps for land affected by flooding in order to provide information to landowners, to the Amherst Conservation Commission and Planning Board, and to other in interested parties, including banks that grant mortgages. Amherst flood maps were last updated in 1983. New and better technology for mapping flood prone areas is now available. And town meeting appropriated funds during several town meeting cycles to update Amherst flood maps. The consulting firm AECOM was hired by the town and has been working with the town, with town staff and FEMA to create new more accurate mapping of floodable areas along rivers and streams in Amherst. 26 miles of streams were studied, including all of the major streams in Brooks and Town. In September 2017, preliminary flood insurance rate maps were presented to members of the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, and the public. At that time, the town became aware of a new method of analyzing flood data and determining flood boundaries. 
This new method had just come into use in the spring of 2017. The town decided to go ahead and appropriate additional, an additional sum of money to update the maps using the 2017 method. The mapping using the new method has now been completed. The new preliminary flood insurance rate maps and flood insurance study have been available online and in the planning department office and town hall for review and comment since June of 2019. They were presented at a public meeting on June 25, 2019, and at that time we sent notifications to all those who own property in the floodplain depicted on the new maps so that they could attend the meeting if they wanted to. The old 1983 maps were based on USGS topography with 10-foot contour intervals. You probably know what 10-foot contour intervals are. If you did a lot of hiking and you looked at the USGS maps to find your way, those had 10-foot contour intervals. They were also based on data gathered up until, the, uh, up until the early 1970s. The new maps are based on the town of Amherst GIS topography, which is very accurate. It has one-foot contour intervals. They are based on more recently gathered data as well. This means that the new maps are more accurate in terms of where flooding occurs. I'd like to show you a comparison of just one area of town, the area around Puffer's Pond, also called Factory Hollow Pond. I apologize for not having had these slides ready for you for your packets, but it just occurred to me that this would be a really good comparison. So the first map is the 1983 map, and it shows Puffer's Pond, or Factory Hollow Pond, right here as a flood, flood zone A, and the Mill River traveling down towards the west. This is all uh, the Mill River recreation area. So the area in dark gray is the 100-year flood, floodplain. You can see that they had um, elevations where they were measuring. So this is elevation 186, 180, 178, 176. So they did have some um, reference to elevations, but they were using this and in interpolating 10-foot uh, contour intervals. So it's not terribly accurate. Um, this map also shows that um, the edges are relatively smooth. And we know that natural topography isn't like that. Um, the second map I'm going to show you, if I can get to it. Let's see, where's the arrow? There it is. The second map is the new floodplain map. Wow. So this is the new insurance rate map. You can see that it's much more detailed because it has um, very irregular edges, just like real land undulations. And the blue areas are the areas that are in the 100-year floodplain. So, of course, Buffers Pond and all of these blue areas going downstream. The brown areas are areas that are in the 500-year floodplain adjacent to the 100-year. And the striped area is the floodway. So that's the floodway that the river takes. Um, the third map that I'm going to show you, if I can grab that arrow, this map is a comparison map. So again, here's Puffer's Pond up here. The blue areas are areas that were in the old floodplain and remain in the new floodplain. The brown areas are areas that were removed from the floodplain, from the old maps. And the green areas were added. So you can see we've done a pretty good um, study of how the maps have changed. This information is online for your convenience. So the next steps are that staff will be working to develop amendments to the zoning bylaw to accompany these maps. Um, we're now in the 90-day appeal period, which ends on February 20th. So there's an appeal period that allows people who have property in these areas to um, approach FEMA with information that they feel will change the way the map is shown. So that ends on February 20th. Once all the appeals have been resolved, we're going to receive a letter of final determination from FEMA. And the date of that letter will begin a six-month compliance period during which the town will need to adopt the new maps and the accompanying zoning regulations. If the town fails to adopt the new maps, the town of Amherst will no longer be able to participate in the flood insurance program 
and people with property in the flood zones will not be able to purchase flood insurance at the government subsidized rates. We'll be back to meet with town council members once the compliance period begins, and we'll bring our consultant, AECOM, and other town staff members to give you a more thorough presentation. And then later on in the summer, or possibly in early fall, we'll meet again with town council one more time to answer your questions and ask that you vote to adopt the new maps and the zoning amendments. So thank you very much for, for listening, and um, with the President of the Council's permission, I can take some questions. Please. Questions? Dorothy. Um, there's been a lot of talk in different parts of the country about what does a 100-year flood zone mean, and many places have had a number of them in a short period of time. So I guess this is the one tool they have to talk about possible flooding, but do the experts feel this is the way to talk about it now in climate change? Please, go ahead. Um, this is the way that FEMA currently talks about it. Um, we tried to push for um, a sort of accommodating climate change in our new maps, and um, FEMA doesn't recognize that. We only recognize past data. So it could come to pass that in the future they change their mind about that, but for now it's, um, it's just past data and they don't consider climate change. Thank you. Uh, Kathy. Thank you, Chris, uh, for this. And as you know, I came in a couple of days ago and you gave me a quick uh, learning curve mm -hmm. elevation on various terms. So you have showed us the floodplain old and floodplain new in terms of floodplains. But we also, in zoning, have flood-prone conservancy, where if I took the zone and overlaid it on the old floodplains. Our conservancies went broader than some of the plains, at least in some areas of town. What I, um, and I'm reading the memo now, do we have to change those floodplain prone conserv, the FPCs versus these plains, or could we make a decision to keep them as is but adopt this definition of floodplain? Go ahead. I think you could make a decision to keep the old flood prone conservancy zoning district. It is really a zoning district and it's not something that's approved by FEMA. Um, it might get confusing after a while and I think it will become clearer as we zero in on zoning amendments that are related to this new set of maps whether or not we want to change or do something with the FPC zone, but for now we're just asking you to look at these new FEMA maps and zoning amendments that will accompany them, and we can consider the FPC zone at some future date. Um, it is true that the FPC zone does move out into areas that are not included in the 100-year flood plain. Can I just do a follow-up, Linda? Sure. Um, the reason I ask is it might be useful when, for the future. I understand we're not is to do some overlays like this, if possible, so people can see the difference. Thank you, we'll do that. Chris, um, as I look at these and listen to Kathy's question, what does the insurance company follow? Is it the FEMA regulations, or by adding additional land to this by what Kathy's suggesting, are we now putting those homeowners that are in that property at a higher rate? Um, it's really um, it's really up to the, well, it's up to the homeowners and the banks as to whether they want to purchase insurance. Usually, if you're in a flood zone and you want to get a mortgage, your bank will insist that you get flood insurance. Right. Um, for people who don't have a mortgage, they can choose to get flood insurance or not. They're not forced to get it, but they do rely on these maps, um, probably this map. Right now we're in a quasi sort of gray area where we have to rely on the old maps where they are more restrictive, and we rely on the new maps where the new maps are more restricted. So um, that's kind of the situation we're in right now. Did I answer your question? In part. It should you, as a homeowner who has a fully paid property, choose not 
to insure. Doesn't that then put you in jeopardy for FEMA help if there is a flood? I would think so. Okay. And then my other question is, as you look at shorelines, particularly after Katrina, Superstorm Sandy, what you've seen along shorelines where there has been increasing flooding is in fact wires put above ground because they don't want them underground because when it floods, the mm -hmm. conduits flood, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's very different than the point that uh, Evan made earlier. So it, it just mm -hmm. reverses. Yep. And I'm assuming that at some point when we set these floodplains, we then have to also make sure that we have looked at the proper location for wiring and stuff like that. Yeah. I would think that's up to the utility company okay. to look at the flood maps okay. and determine if they want to take the risk or perhaps use some you know, um, more advanced way of, of covering and closing mm -hmm. conduits to keep them from flooding. Um, but that's really something that the utility okay. company would decide and, okay. and not something that the town needs to really get involved in. Thank you. Are there qu questions? Yes. Andy? Oh, I'm sorry. Other, yes. Shalini. Do we know what is the net increase or decrease in flooding plain? Has, with the changes, have the increased land under flooding plains or has it decreased? Um, in terms of land area, I don't know. Um, my colleagues who are the technical people do have counts as far as um, numbers of structures that are either in or out of the floodplain. I think um, structures have been removed from the floodplain, but I don't know the exact count. So that's a question that next time we come to you, um, we'll have an answer for that. So, Shalini. Have there been uh, residents who've come up to complain about or change, ask for a change? Um, there has been one uh, landowner who has been um, asking for a change, and he would ask for a change to reduce the area of floodplain on his property um, to make it more developable. But he needs to file an appeal, and he, what happens is they file the appeal with the town, and then the town sends it on to FEMA, and FEMA considers whether it's um, a valid appeal or not. Okay. Yes. So, so just to uh, respond to residents who may want to, so the process would be to uh, appeal, and what, and then the, the burden is on them to provide evidence why they think it should not change, or what sort of evidence or supporting support supporting documents do they need to give? Um, well, I must say at this point it's um, it's a little late in the game. You know, we did notify everybody back in June that we were. Do, you know, working on these new maps, um, we notified all the property owners. They had an opportunity to come to a public meeting. Um, we put all the documents online. I think we sent out uh, press releases, and we, I think we sent out a press release when the appeal period started in November. And so I think we've given people a really good uh, opportunity to respond if they chose to. But the only um, the only person I've heard from is this one person who I believe is probably going to submit an appeal. Other comments? Yes, Evan. Uh, so I have a million quite technical questions I could have asked. We had a conversation about this in the past, given that my graduate research is in this. Um, but what is striking to me, um, so the last time we did this was 1983, um, which was <laughs> before I was born. Um, <laughs> just, just to throw that out there, um, and, and I guess I'm just curious if it's typical to wait such a long period of time to be updated, um, and there was a statement made in your memo that we will likely sit with these flood maps for decades, um, and trying to reconcile that with your answer to Dorothy Pam's question about um, climate change um, and the fact that um, these models only build in past data, which is unreliable going forward. Um, if there's a thought that there'll be um, an increasing frequency with which we update these flood maps, or if like 40 years is sort of the general time that we sit with these things. Yes. I think the coastal cities and towns are updated or have been updated more recently. 
Um, I don't know how far back their maps went, but I know that there was a, a focus on coastal cities and towns, and also a focus on towns that abut the rivers. Um, in our case, we actually chose to take on this project because we noticed that there was such a discrepancy between our flood prone conservancy maps and what we saw as the old FEMA maps. So we initiated this project. Um, it turns out now that the federal government, FEMA, is initiating a project for uh, this whole region. So, but that's really not going to be coming to pass for several more years. And so um, we're kind of a unique town in that we chose to do this on our own. Um, so I really don't know what the average time lapses between one set of maps and another, but for us it is, what is that, 37 years, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions at this time? I just want to point out this is one of three times you'll be coming before us. Yep. Alyssa? When you bring those numbers back the next time of how many property structures are in or out, if you could also give us a sense of how many people actually needed to get this notice. Was it five people, 5,000 people, four people? Um, that would just just give us a sense of scale as we're explaining it to the community. Like, don't worry if you didn't get a notice. It wasn't about you. Um, and that would be helpful. Thank you. We are about to send out notices because there's a grandfathering that is allowed. Um, I think if you have flood insurance, um, and your property is in the flood zone, you are able to keep your flood insurance at the same rate. If you don't have flood insurance and your property is newly into the floodplain, there's a different calculus. Anyway, we're going to be doing a mailing in the next week or so to about 400, to owners of about 400 properties to let them know that there is this grandfathering opportunity if they want to take advantage of it. Okay. Mandy Jo. So I, I actually looked at a number of the detailed maps because I was curious. Um, and one thing I noticed was it was only certain rivers that were mapped or certain, you know, sort of streams, however you want to call them, brooks and all. Is that standard for something like this, um, that you only pick certain ones? Is it, do they have to have a certain size in order to be mapped? So that, that's my first question. My second is, I noticed the downtown was not mapped. Could you talk about, and I'm assuming it's just a standard for FEMA flood mapping, um, where this is a river flood mapping, not a sort of flash flood, massive storm flood mapping that when the drainage systems in hardscapes are overwhelmed, um, do we do, and, and then do we do any of that sort of hardscape flood mapping for flash flood type? purposes. This is really um, flood mapping that's associated with streams and brooks, bodies of water. Um, I believe that we mapped all of the flood areas that were mapped originally, went back and either looked at them again or decided that whatever uh, information they had was okay at, at that time. Um, but it wouldn't include um, places like downtown because downtown doesn't really have any streams and rivers running through it, uh, except Tanbrook. Of course, but um, and the other thing is, the center of town is on a hill, so you know water kind of runs downhill and it doesn't really puddle here. There's not really much of a chance of um, of flooding in this area. There is a chance of flooding in the North Amherst Village Center, um, so that's you know an area that was remapped. You can see it on that map right there, the Montague Road and Sunderland Road, and then what's in between. Right. So that's. Um, it's got a, a big floodplain right, right there. Right. Additional questions or comments at this time? Okay. Okay. Thank right. you. Thank we'll you very see much. you again. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, moving on. David, I believe you're up next regarding some property. I'm sorry? We had public comment. Let's I'm, thank you. Is there any public comment with regard to the flood mapping? Nope. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. Good evening. I'll try to be brief. In your packets was uh, information regarding the uh, a piece of property uh, in North Amherst 
um, um, owned by the Zala family. And this may be the first time, I'm not sure if the commission has dealt with a chapter 61 um, process before, but I just wanted to make a few comments about the process. I think this was really kind of a first look for you and, and uh, I will take my council. direction. Mm -hmm. I'll take my direction from, from you, uh, Lynn, as to how deep and happy to answer questions. I'm not here to advocate for the applicant. Um, so in, in short, um, Chapter 61A is a tax classification that allows, um, in this case, a, a property owner, a farmer, uh, to enjoy lower taxes um, in exchange for them committing to keeping the um, property in, uh, in this case, agriculture. That's what the A stands for on Chapter 61A. When that any owner uh, of land in that uh, classification goes to sell or convert the land, the municipality has the right uh, of first refusal. So what's been offered to the town is the right of first refusal. So the town of Amherst has the opportunity to purchase the land. Uh, all throughout Massachusetts, communities look at uh, these opportunities and um, a municipality can step into that uh, purchase and sale agreement and uh, choose to exercise their right of first refusal. What typically has happened historically in Amherst is a um, the planning board and the conservation commission uh, prior uh, to the council being formed, uh, they would make a recommendation, both those bo bodies would make a recommendation to the select board. In this case, uh, they would come to you. So the uh, planning board uh, took up this issue last week and the conservation commission will take it up on Wednesday of this week. Um, unfortunately, uh, this notice um, due to your busy schedule, CONCOM and planning board's uh, busy schedules and holiday schedules, um, this was not acted upon in, in uh, the normal uh, kind of more expedient fashion. So the clock is ticking on us. Uh, we really only have until March 6th, which is a, a, f a 120 day period from the time we received the notice to the time if the town wanted to act. Um, so uh, I will report that the planning board last week um, did vote to recommend to you that the town not exercise its right of first refusal on this uh, property. I was there for the discussion. Um, um, Ms. Brestrup will be writing you a memo, which uh, should be ready later on this week, and um, the Co uh, Conservation Commission, I'm sure, will put together a memo as well. The planning board, if I could summarize without speaking for them, um, the property is in the PRP, the Professional Research Park Zoning. Um, it does not contain uh, soils of uh, the highest uh, quality uh, that we would find in other places in Amherst. And there are no uh, um, uh, species of special concern. Um, these are many of the factors that the planning board and or the conservation commission would look at while making a recommendation to you. So I think I'll stop there. Um, I will say that if, if a town and we'll get these from time to time. We don't get a lot. We might get maybe two a year. Sometimes we'll go a couple of years without any of them. Um, if, we, if, a t if the town does ever want to step into a, a right of first refusal, it's a very uh, prescribed process and needs to happen, frankly, very quickly. Um, we typically have 45 days to close on the property. So it makes it very challenging for municipalities when they do want to acquire a piece of property uh, like this. So um, I think I'll stop there and I'm sure there may be some questions. Okay, questions from the council at this time. Yes, Pat. It seems to me it would be quite beneficial to the tax base if this property were re commercial industrial, um, if we went forward with the industrial park idea. Um, right now we rely com almost completely on residential taxes and this would be a way of um, opening the tax base up. And that seems to me to be a counterbalance to the conservation aspect of this. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Um, well, I will say that my recommendation, I'll, I'll preview that for Wednesday night, will be to the commission that we not exercise our right of first refusal. Now, of course, they're an independent group and they can choose to make a recommendation uh, uh, different than what I recommend to them. But um, in fact, it has never been, this parcel has never been identified on the open space and recreation plan as a priority. 
Um, it has been zoned PRP, Professional Research Park, for um, upwards of 30 years. And in fact, um, I think the town has always looked at it as a, as a area, uh, the entire area uh, from um, uh, Coles Road north on the uh, east side of Sunderland Road as you're heading out toward 116, most of that is PRP. Uh, the area, in fact, where the new solar uh, field went was also uh, zoned PRP. So I think the town's intentions there were to use that land uh, in part to broaden the tax base. Evan. Oh, I'm sorry. Kathy. It's all right. I didn't it's, see it's just, it's just a hand. That's okay. Um, I, I, I'm right that we're only being asked about the fighter right of first refusal here. So the Pat's question of does this go from PRP to light industrial, that's a decision that's going to be made somewhere else. Oh, I, I might have misunderstood that. Yes, this is professional research park. We also have a zoning uh, category, light industrial. That area, a light industrial is off of Meadow Street. So we're, we're not talking about a zoning change here. This is just right. the right of first I mean, refusal. the document mentions that as, as a desire for them. And so that, to the extent that's going to happen, that's not what we're doing tonight at all. Correct. And in fact, okay. we are, I would defer to the town manager, but I don't think we're looking for a decision on this tonight. No. This is simply a first look, and we would come back by your next meeting. We would have the recommendation right. from the planning board, from the conservation commission, and more information from staff. That's so correct. So this is just a first look tonight, and uh, I'd be happy to take away any questions, or if you'd like additional information, we could get that to you in your packet prior to your next meeting in two weeks. Dorothy. As I remember, uh, the majority of the property is not buildable because it's wetlands, and there was only a small portion, I forget the dimensions, that were available for building, and that there was also a question about roads to and from the building because of the wetlands. Yes, I believe you were at the planning board meeting uh, that I was at um, a week or so ago. Yes, so in fact, the property is, is just over 38 acres. It's a fairly large property, undeveloped property. It has been in farming for a number of years. The Zala family is, a, is an old Amherst Hadley uh, farm family that has owned hundreds of acres in town. And in fact, we bought some land from the same family across the street, you recall, right. in a high priority zone for conservation to the west of 116. So the property is 38, um, over 38 acres. There's only about uh, nine or 10 acres that are buildable of that. It has already been delineated. Um, there is a preliminary delineation that has gone through the Conservation Commission. I do not believe it has been fully accepted yet, um, but uh, uh, it, is, it seems quite clear that about nine or 10 acres of the land is developable. Okay, other questions? Uh, yes, a little. So back in the olden days, Mr. Zomek, so as you indicated, this would normally have gone to Conservation Commission before it came to us so that we'd have that sense right away, oh, it was the priority or it wasn't the priority, just as you've just said. But it, I believe from what you said that because of the timing of this, just with everything else that was going on, you wanted to make sure we saw it. Yes. Knowing that those other things are happening and we don't have that many more meetings scheduled before the time runs out. And is it also fair to say, based, I'm asking you to confirm what I'm about to say, which is that typically when we get these, which like you said, might be a couple times a year, might not be for a year or two, it's because they want us to move faster than we are required to do. Then, then we have this window of time that we're allowed to act in, but frequently when people make this request, they're like, and could you hurry up and make a decision in the next month? Because we'd really like to close sooner. And so usually then, you know, you are racing around trying to get Conservation Commission and everybody else informed so that we can be sensitive to the needs of the property owner, even though technically we have a large window to act within. But usually the I'm familiar with some other attorneys who you tend to see on these things over and over again, they will say, could you do this sooner than you have to do it? And it's because they simply want to move forward. And so when we do, we've sometimes felt time pressure in the past due to that. We have actual time pressure now because that clock is ticking, but we still have time. We still have time. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, normally we would be feeling some of that pressure. And I think in this case, we didn't get as much as we normally do. I will say that um, if, if uh, the council does not take any action, 
essentially uh, it's uh, prescriptively granted. In other words, um, your right of first refusal uh, goes away after March 6. So the council doesn't have to take any action uh, at your next meeting. Uh, you could choose to take no action and therefore uh, we would not have that right any longer. Um, but again, as I said, we'd like to bring you some more information, bring you that information from the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, and any staff recommendations. Um, I believe your next meeting is on the 24th? Correct. Yeah. So, Correct. Thank, if no other questions, thank okay. you. Any other questions? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, Mr. Bachman, you wanna come forward? So thank you. Um, we have a unique opportunity to present to you tonight, and it's to uh, conduct some major capital work to an iconic building in North Amherst, the North Amherst Library, at virtually no or low cost to the town. And we have been, I have been working on this um, for a bit of time and trying to uh, bring it to a full enough uh, situation where I felt comfortable where I could bring it to the public and to the council. Uh, there are no decisions. You're not being asked to make any decisions tonight, but I am interested in sort of feedback from the council if we want me to continue putting time into this effort or not. So um, we all know the North Amherst Library at the intersection of Montague Road and Sunderland, an iconic historic building uh, that houses uh, our small library. Uh, it is not accessible to the handicapped. It's not accessible to anybody who can't navigate stairs. It has no restrooms in it, uh, but it's beloved in North Amherst. An anonymous donor approached us to offer funds to make the North Amherst Library fully accessible to add restrooms that would be available to the public and perhaps to add a, a community room or meeting room. And asked if we would entertain the idea of exploring that. So we did a bunch of due diligence to figure out how much money it would cost to do the kinds of things that um, were being suggested or requested, and also to, to gauge the interest of the, proper, of the anonymous donor to see if they really were truly interested in supporting this project or not. Um, so I, had, I made it early on from the very beginning, said this is a project that is on our capital plan but not in the near future because we have so many other capital needs that are facing the town that this was not seen as a priority by the town. Uh, um, I think it was, in FY, it was listed in FY23, but I think that was not even realistic in our, um, in our capital plan. And so it was important for the anonymous donor to realize that but for private funding, this project would not be advanced. Um, the seriousness and sincerity of the anonymous donor motivated me to take steps to determine if this was a doable project or not. Um, I've shared the basic information uh, with the anonymous donor. Um, we went, we secured services of Coon Riddle to look at the building to determine what needed to be done to the building to accomplish the goals that uh, we had established pr uh, earlier, which was, again, to make the building, make the building accessible uh, to people who couldn't navigate stairs, put in two restrooms, and then on a separate piece to add a community room as a se separate standalone project that could be yes or no. Um, ask Kuhn Riddle to take into consideration the impact on the building, because it's a historic, iconic building, you had to think of um, whether an elevator had to be, would have to be included or not, um, whether there were other ways to access the building, um, and also to consider, even though it would be exempt from the net zero bylaw, to, that would be something that's, because of the council's goals, something that we would want to have to factor in as well. Um, Kuhn Riddle came back with some ballpark figures, which are listed in the memo. In short, the, mem the ballpark figures run from 750000 to $1.15 million. Um, this is plus, there would be architecture fees, usually they run around 20%, this is what's going on right now, of two hundred to $250,000. Um, we tested these sort of ballpark figures with a, um, 
a construction person who estimates for a living uh, for construction today, and they, were, they vetted out very close to what our ballpark figures were. So we have solid information about what it would cost to do this. Um, circled back with the anonymous donor, said, are you interested in this? They continued to be interested. Um, uh, at first, we thought there was some urgency in terms of the, what time of year it needed to be done, but it, there wasn't. But there's an urgency with the anonymous donor who wants to see this happen. Um, so what I'm looking at doing is uh, taking steps based on money in the bank, in essence. So if the anonymous donor is able to contribute the money that we need or uh, um, to prepare the plans, we would then, with the money, I can't, I can't sign a contract unless there's, there are funds in the bank to sign a contract with an architect or whoever. So once the money is donated, we would, I would move forward with an RFP for um, a, an architect and sign a contract with an architect, initiate a public engagement process because people in North Amherst and people in the town of Amherst have not talked about this at all. You know, whether we want to do it or not, um, what it would look like, how do we want a community room or not, do we, is this, you know, how all these things would work, fit together. Um, and we would go through that process. At the conclusion of that process, if it's successful, we will have a set of plans and a design that would go to the council and say, does this feel good to you? And then, um, so, and we would stop. And then we would, we would not move forward with it. We would have an estimate for what that would cost. And then we would go back to the anonymous donor and say, this is what it cost to do this vision that the community agreed on. So that it would be a community design, design uh, the community would contribute to design in terms of working with the architect and hearing feedback. Um, and then not, turn over a shovel of dirt until all the money was in the bank through, through the donation to move forward to the next to construction. If we have the funds that we think it would cost to do construction and that was donated, um, then we would move forward. Um, you know, there, there are issues that it's not just money in the bank. There are other issues that the council and I would want to take into consideration and the library director. If we have a new building, what is the staffing requirements going to be? What are the expectations for maintenance? Right now, the library maintains the uh, North Amherst Library. Um, it, if it become, has a community room, has a restrooms that are open to the public, it brings along with it other maintenance issues that we would want to have that conversation about. Um, who would man if there's a community room? Who manages it? Is it available just when the library is open? We wouldn't want that because the hours are pretty limited. Um, but who schedules it and who watches over it, and you can you know, have a separate entrance to it. Um, and also, that the important to note that this would make people, it would allow people to get into the building. There'd be a chairlift that gets into the main library where it is now, um, but the stacks and moving, navigating throughout the stacks would still not be available to anybody in a wheelchair. There's just not enough space for that. So it accomplishes a, a fair amount of where we want to go. Um, so I thought it was timely to bring it to the council. Um, I think it's important that um, if we get the funds in place for design, we will go that far. We don't move forward until the funds are in place um, for construction. And so I present that to you tonight to hear any feedback you have. And if you think it's a good idea, if you are you going to say, no, stop, don't work on this more, um, and just open to your feedback. Pat. It's an absolutely wonderful idea, and I, there's no reason not to go forward. And I thank whoever this person is. Additional comments? Dorothy? In the Jones Library, a person in a wheelchair can't get to the stacks either, can they? And now, no. Right. So when this has been mentioned to me, and it has been mentioned several times, that they would not be able to get in the stacks, that's not a unique disability to this plan. Agreed. Kathy. And, and in fact, in this, anyone who hasn't been there should go there. The librarian gets you the books. I can't, I can't reach the top shelf either, and I'm not in a wheelchair. It's just, it's, uh, it feels like 
everybody's overflowing living room with books. Mm -hmm. um, and their books down in the basement in storage, which they come in to bring them up. So while you can't roam around in it in a wheelchair, you can be uh, completely feeling at home in it. And actually, there are two living room chairs that you could, if you wanted to, sit in. And so I, and I agree with Pat. The, the generosity is amazing. And I, I think the um, plan you've presented of getting input on does the larger community want this with or without a community room um, you know, what level of enthusiasm is there is great. The other thing I saw um, in your memo, which I thought was a, a major point, right now it's um, a very old-fashioned heating mm -hmm. and cooling system. It's window air conditioners. Mm -hmm. There are no many splits in it. It uses an oil-based small uh, heater, which there is a bathroom in the basement, just you can't get to it. Mm -hmm. So there were, uh, in this, some of the specs, it was we could modernize some of that and make it less expensive to run as a building as part of this, without solar collectors even, we mm -hmm. could be doing something to making the space uh, more comfortable with less costs. Absolutely, yeah. Additional comments? Amanda. I was just, I, I'm gonna go back to the accessibility issue. Um, I haven't looked at the plans recently, but if we add an accessible lift, would a wheelchair be able to make it to the desk? Like, or would it really be a wheelchair into the bathroom area and the new portion only? Like, would there be enough room to at least get to where Kathy was talking about? I know it's a very small building. Right, so the concept that, that Kuhn Riddle came up with, and I don't think we've shared that with folks, is um, that there would be a lift that would go up to get you to that main floor. Um, there's some discussion about maybe even flipping the rooms to say the new, if there, if there were a community room, the, the library part would be where the community room might be in the back and in the front, but that's a discussion. And I didn't want to put forward a design because I f felt like that would pre prejudice Pretty people true. and just, and I don't think that we're there. It's, this is just sort of, our whole thing was like, okay, throw something together, give us a design that we can test the numbers so our whole mission was to see, is there an appetite with the anonymous donor to move forward on it, and are the numbers realistic so that this person would say, I'm, I'm good with this, and that's where we want to be at this moment in time. Evan? Uh, so I have a question and a concern, I suppose. Um, the question, and this is just purely based on some of my ignorance around what's being proposed for that intersection, um, is if there's any um, implications. I, I know we are pursuing potentially a roundabout at that intersection that will perhaps involve consuming some of the property in that. Um, and I'm, I'm curious, because I haven't seen designs, because I don't know either designs for a potential roundabout, which I don't think exist, or designs for what's being proposed to the library, if there is some relationship between that project that might impact whether or not this is the right time to do this. Um, the concern I have was mentioned in your memo, and I do want to highlight, because I, I would push back on Pat's statement of, I don't see any reason not to do this. Um, we know that the library's budget is really tight. There have been concerns from some counselors about um, uh, part-time staff, and we've heard from the library that <clears throat> staffing is an issue with their current budget. Um, and the concern about staffing a, a larger facility, staffing a potential meeting room, is only going to further strain the budget of the library. And so I would be interested in seeing um, some more uh, exploration of that. I don't necessarily, I'm not opposed to this project, but I do think what we hear time and time again is that the library's budget is really strained um, we as a community are not investing enough in the library f for them to be able to do what they need to do already. Um, and now they're, the Jones Library is currently going out and asking for significant donations to be able to do the project over there. Um, you know, I, I think that there, there's something to be said about making sure um, that we don't create a great facility um, and then say to the library, now figure out how to staff it without pairing that with greater investment in the library's budget um, 
from, from the town? So I'll answer the second one first. That was precisely the concern of the director, the library director, saying, okay, you give me a new building, and do I have to add staff, and how do I afford that? You give me more space I have to maintain, how do I afford that? Where is that going to show up in my budget? Do I have to cut someplace else to be able to do that? So that's a, a very important conversation to have, um, and one of the reasons that we, I noted that in the conversation. Um, in terms of the um, potential changes to any intersections up there, uh, ask the superintendent of public works to lay out the constraints for where we couldn't uh, break. And so it, no matter what we chose to do, he's laid out the constraints on where we could work and where we couldn't work, and allowing for parking for the, the North Amherst Library as well. So we needed to create uh, a, an entrance with parking that did not impinge upon, say if we want, the current plan has been to relocate Sunderland Road to Montague Road, and whether there's enough room to accomplish all that. And so that was one of the constraints we put on the architect when we talked about it. Shall do we know what are the intentions of the donor in terms of what they really want to see? Because I can envision that we deal with the handicap accessibility and that would not entail new staff or anything. So we're accepting the donor, you know, we're getting a generous donation to fix an old building that will make it more accessible to our town. So we should seriously be considering that and be really grateful and working with the donors to expedite that process to make it easy for them to give the money to us and at the same time you know doing it what i'm saying is we could do it without burdening the staff so um yes the anonymous donor wasn't the first intention of the anonymous donor wasn't to create a community room it was just to create restrooms and accessibility and that's why we broke it into two sections because there was talk about a community room needed in north amherst and was this an appropriate site for it or not? And um, it was helpful to see, you know, what, how much more would it cost to add a community room? And even if we didn't want to do it now, please design the addition so that a community room could be added down the road if, if the town ever chose to go that route. So that was sort of the logic of it. George. <clears throat> I'm just a little concerned about the timing, given that we're also considering a major project for the Jones, and so um, it, this is a very generous offer. It's something that, that people have been wanting to do for a long time, but now it's happening, or it looks like it's in, you know, might be happening at the same time, I'm trying to make a major decision about our central library. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it doesn't say I'm for or against, it just is a concern about the timing. and. The challenge of trying, it seems like we've almost caught between two projects and I'm worried about them being in competition in some way. So maybe they won't be, maybe, I mean, the money is, is being offered in a sense for free, but it also involves town resources and probably will involve a little bit of town money. At the same time, we're trying to make a decision about, about the Jones itself. Um, so it's just a concern I have, I guess, about the timing. So I think that's a legitimate concern. I think. Um, that's something we think about as well. I think that uh, the anonymous donors made it clear that this is, it's for this project, but not the Jones project. Um, and there wasn't an intention for, you know, it's not, it's, this, this donation would not be siphoning anything from the Jones library, um, but it would be a capital project that we'd be devoting staff time to and trying to facilitate it through the permitting process and things like that. All right. One of the questions um, I raised is this, uh, came forward to be put on the agenda was what is the policy of the town with regard to accepting gifts? Um, you know, if somebody gives you land, you have to decide can you maintain it? But in this case, we already own this building. And I really urge, not necessarily in this case, but at some point that the council really consider developing a policy about gifts that are at above a certain limit and for that matter, even if they might be controversial. Should somebody, for instance, want to give us money to build an offensive statue in the middle of you know, the street, uh, we're not gonna accept that gift, at least I'm not. Um, so, and this is a very standard process that higher education institutions and other institutions go through, is that they have guidelines for what gifts they will accept, and they, in fact, on, on rare occasions, but nevertheless do 
decide that a gift is just not appropriate for their purposes. Having said that, I think this is a wonderful and generous offer, and I hope that there's other people in our town who will think about gifts for other things we might like. Well, I think the bid has some ideas for how people can donate money for right. a lot of different projects in there. Right. In their I have a few, a few in my list. <laughs> okay. Alyssa. Thank you for saying that because I was going to bring up much the same thing. Um, this person has been very patient and very generous. This has been perking for a while, so I appreciate that they have, they have stuck with it and, and worked with you and you've worked out the numbers. In terms of why not to accept it, I, I think Evan made a really excellent point there and I'm really glad to hear that we have really looked at the possible intersection designs because this is exactly why sometimes we don't know what future consequences will be of things that we do in case it's outside the current footprint. For example, the Jones Garden. No one envisioned when that garden was created that it was going to then be used as a reason not to renovate the Jones Library. So it just seemed like an amazing gift at the time, and it has been an amazing gift, but it had consequences down the line in terms of the conversations and the possibilities. So knowing that we are certain <laughs> that whatever we do won't go that direction where, where I think makes a really big difference. The other thing I think is great is the idea of while being incredibly grateful to this donor, which we are and we're very excited about this, is that we are including a public process, not just saying it meets our policy or it doesn't meet our policy that doesn't exist as to accepting a gift, because I think it will be really useful for the community to try and work through, do we want a community room? Because there will be people who say, and I'm not arguing this, I'm saying there will be people who say, well, it's really nice if you install this expensive lift to move people to sit in front of the checkout desk. But like, what's the point? I mean, they can get into more of the Jones Library. They can get, but if there are people who are living in that area who find that really useful to just go to the front desk, that's the kind of thing we can hear from the community or we can hear from more people in the community who say, I want them to have access to a community room. Like, you can't get in between the stacks, but you can be there for a community room. But just getting to go and hang out at the front desk maybe isn't as compelling to people. Mm -hmm. But that's how we'll find mm -hmm. that out, is by doing that community process. So thank you for lining out all those steps for us. Okay. Are there other comments or questions at this time? Okay, seeing none, then thank you. Thank you. So what I will do, I will start talking about this in public. Um, and start to move forward with, if the anonymous donor is willing to provide the funds, then putting the staff time in to support this. Great. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm gonna make a suggestion that we uh, deal with the next item and then potentially go into executive session and then come back out. But the next item is in fact the proposed Proposal on Changes to the Public Way Regulations on Lincoln Ave. Let me preface this by saying, as requested at the Town Council meeting on January 27th concerning park your, parking regulations on Lincoln Way, a detailed memo with various attachments, including the petition from the neighbors, have been added to your packet. In addition, a copy of all of the other items referred referring to past actions by the select board that were in your packet last week have been packaged and placed in your packet again are referred to in links in the memo from the town manager. The bottom line is we've tried to give you a lot more information and do it in a much more orderly fashion. The decision before the council tonight is to recommend to the president to schedule a hearing on March 9th, I guess it is, uh, 2020, uh, to consider the recommendation from the town manager, so we're very clear, regarding the proposed changes in parking regulations on Lincoln Ave. This decision is based upon the evidence presented, although I will give you a caveat in that, it is not based upon whether you believe we should accept, reject, refer, or continue the hearing based upon the recommendations from the town. That is what we will do at the hearing. So we're not here to debate this issue tonight. 
We are only here to decide whether we're going to, whether you're going to advise me to set up a hearing. While TAC has not rendered an opinion at this time, they have the opportunity to render an opinion prior to any hearing regarding this proposal. And the petitioners have, in fact, been in touch with TAC, and there has been an attempt to schedule a TAC meeting in a timely manner so that they can do so. So this is up for discussion, and the discussion is, do you have enough information or what additional information would you like to see if we go into a hearing? Aly Alyssa. So I want to leap in since I was so adamant about this last time, and I think that we now have the information I was hoping we were going to get before. And so I think we're in great shape, and I think it would be great if we could just offer quick comments on what tiny bit of additional information we might want when it comes time for the hearing, you know, ideally, obviously, that Wednesday before kind of deal so that we're not seeing it as we come in. We have so much great data. I think um, information we're missing, our existing conditions need to be mapped the same way the proposed conditions are mapped. That's just not a habit of this town. That's just how we do things. And it's so much harder. I, you all tried to do it, to do it with just words rather than the map. And so I'd really like a map of existing conditions that's made in the same fashion. And the other thing is if we could be able to give people a sense of, now these spaces are not lined, but to give people a sense of what the net loss of spaces is, because there already is a lot of for, forbidden area along there, but being able to say to people some, you know, I know that we have professionals who can estimate that sort of thing without having to go out and measure the actual marked spaces. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other thing I wanted to add is that although I myself reviewed the motion and now am thinking about it again, um, when we do the legal notice that has to go in the newspaper for this, which we're required to do by our own general bylaws, we always use this phrasing about the public way and nobody knows what we're talking about. So if we, and I've already mentioned this to Paul and Athena, if when the time comes, I don't need to change the motion, but if when the time comes when we do the legal notice, if we could somehow include the word parking in there so it catches people's eye, because public way is like, what's that? Okay. Any further comments about what you need to see for the hearing? Mandy Jo. I just wanted to respond to Alyssa and the number of loss. So the downtown parking study actually included Lincoln Avenue in the study and they had parking spot numbers. And so uh, on the proposal, the permanent loss would be approximately, I had to guess with how many fit within a 30 foot range, um, but I, I went with 20 feet per spot because I think our current average is around 22 when we line is approximately 47 spots. And then the weekday loss would be an additional approximately 142. With a, so total during the eight to five range would be approximately 190 spots lost. Okay. We will add information again. I don't want to get into the details. Thank you. We'll add that information for the packet. It was, it, there's report, the parking report has that information. Thank you. Steve. So just for full disclosure, I'm of a position that there should be parking on every street in Amherst, that there should be no locally owned streets. I know, okay. That's not so, the discussion okay. tonight. So really what my concern is part of the discussion here regarding the right of way. So the right of way on Lincoln, I believe is 23 feet. There are streets all over Amherst that are 23 foot right of ways. By using that as an argument for having no parking on the street puts every other street in risk, which I think would have huge implications. I also think there'd be huge implications of where do these people park? These are obviously motivated parkers that will go somewhere else. And so where exactly are there? They so have, has anyone looked anywhere in the, the study? So one of the things that will be an option as we have a hearing is to decide whether or not we are going to accept, recommend, defer, or refer and one of the options is, is that, in fact, we may refer it to a place like CRC for additional consideration. If I may, Taking I in those kinds of implications. So I had a comment there also. Um, also, we there are some arguments that we can't do. I, I, you know, I don't remember exactly that some possibilities were eliminated, like um, two-hour parking was eliminated. 
But there's no discussion of limiting other. This is getting into the issue, Steve. This is information I'd like. Like, um, why not alternate to side of the street parking? Why not um, parking meters? Why not other ways of managing parking? So the, I, I haven't seen a whole bunch of other alternates um, discussed and eliminated. I've only seen one or two. Okay, thank you. Darcy? Um, uh, sort of along the lines of what I was bringing up previously in the meeting, um, I'm interested in finding out what what is our criteria for having a hearing on a traffic and safety issue? Um, what can I recommend to my own constituents if they want to have a public hearing on the speed limit on Southeast Street or the dangerous intersection at South Amherst Common or the dangerous um, crossing in front of Crocker Farm School or speeding on Mill Lane or the crosswalk at Potwine and 116. Can each one of those groups, because they are, there are groups for each one of those, can they come to us and ask for a hearing? There's a couple different ways that the charter describes coming forward to us. One is, and there's various levels for petition. In this case, the neighbors came forward, they met with the town manager, and they met with a number of other people and put it into a format that does not, in fact, meet the requirement for the petition. Out of that, the town manager did, in fact, go to DPW, the fire and police, and put together the memo. Yes. So absent um, community members fulfilling the charter requirements, what is the criteria that we're using to be able to give a particular group in the community a public hearing? Um, why does one group get a public hearing and others don't? Um, so I'm just, I am not leaning toward giving a public hearing to any group that comes to us with a traffic and safety concern. Um, unless they have 150 people signing a petition on, under the charter. Okay. Kathy. Um, I want to build on that. I think it is a separable issue, and we should think through how would we set up a policy on how this would happen. Um, but for additional information, um, you know, on this situation, I think we need to think more holistically. So I would like whatever memo on a preferred solution, both to have, as Steve said, what alternatives are there and why were they less preferred, but implications for neighboring streets. The small paragraph we had from TAC when they first talked about it said if they, people can't park on Lincoln, will they pack, park on Dana? Will they park on, name whatever the next street over is. Um, and so would, and that goes into then Darcy, will then that neighborhood group come and say, not here. So I think we need to have some way of saying what is an approach to all of this. And, and I'm just asking, I think it's gonna take some thinking. I know in the Tufts neighborhood where my daughter was living as a, um, worker, not a student, uh, street after street had provisions. They all had provisions because the overflow from Tufts was huge, but it, it wasn't like one street and the next street, every street had a provision on it. Um, so uh, trying to think of a surrounding area as this might be the first step, not to slow this one down, because um, I think we did ask for a plan and we have one, but that would, I just want to have that be the next thing we try to think through and I'm no longer sure which committee does these issues. It seems like CRC, but I don't know. One of the things, again, that happens with the hearing is the possibility that it is then referred, one of the possibilities, is that it is referred with a sense of that larger look that you want. Um, Dorothy. Well, assuming that we have a hearing, there is some information that I would like. Uh, and it would include um, how many people are using Lincoln as a direct road to UMass. And um, I know our neighboring street, Sunset, does not have any parking, same width. 
Um, how many accidents occur at the intersection of Amity and Lincoln? Last weekend was a really rather amazing thing with a flaming car and the street closed up and down. Uh, there were two major crashes. Uh, also, I'd like research on what is the average speed of people going down Amity, because if you're going down, people kind of pick up a, a pace, and you find you can't get through the intersection if you're going to make a right into Lincoln, because there's cars on either side and parked cars, and you can't do, you cannot make that turn if there are parked cars on both sides. Uh, you can't slow down. Uh, without causing an accident. I don't know, I'd love to know more details about the two accidents last weekend. Um, and I know that um, I live nearby. Uh, I, there's a certain sound I hear. It means t two, two cars have hit broadside because we have um, the c people coming from the, the block of Lincoln from uh, Route 9 to uh, Amity can't make that cr intersection. The, the proposal or the concept mm -hmm. before the council tonight is are we going to schedule a hearing based on the, on the town manager's memo? That's the question. If after we have that hearing, mm -hmm. should we have that hearing, you and all of this other stuff, and then it goes to a committee, and then we talk about it some more, and it comes back, fine. If we can get some of this other information, that's good. And I don't, I'm not just saying this to Dorothy. I'm saying this to all of you. We, you asked for certain things two weeks ago. We got them for you. We've said this is what the hearing would be about. Now the question is, are you advising me to set the hearing? Andy. Yeah. Um, like several of you, um, the question was initially presented, what issues would we like to have developed as for information for the hearing? And I think that's taken us down a path um, because I thought about questions in advance that I have noted and highlighted in yellow. And the question was, well, how do they get before us? Uh, frankly, I think that they get before us at a hearing. And uh, that's what the purpose of the hearing is. And if the information we ask at the hearing is not provided, there's another option in addition to what the president has mentioned, that is to continue the hearing. There's no reason you close a hearing at the time you have it. Um, so uh, rather than get into questions that I have, I think I would prefer to postpone it and just get to the core issue. And the core issue now is um, that the town manager has made a recommendation for parking um, regulation changes on a particular street and should we have a hearing about that doesn't mean um, do we have the information or we what we should do after we have the hearing um, or how long the hearing will be and um, I hope we can get to that um, core question okay additional questions or comments at this time I'm sorry, George. I would authorize you to go ahead and set the hearing. I think we have enough information and we will have staff present and we can ask them questions. And if we need more information, we can continue the hearing. Um, but I think it's time for us to, to move ahead. Um, the issue, the larger issue of how this process should work is something that GOL in fact has taken on and we hope to have something to give to you to think about at some point in the near future. Um, but in the meantime, we do have a proposal and I think we should uh, move ahead to a hearing. And uh, if you have further questions, concerns, that's the time to raise them. And we'll have staff here present to, to answer them. And if we still don't have enough information, we continue the hearing, or we can close the hearing and make a decision. Further comment or question? Alyssa. So I had asked for some specific things that I hope will be included associated with the hearing. And I think some of the other things we're hearing are things that people are gonna wanna ask at the hearing. And so staff would be, would be smart to write those down now and plan to answer them at the hearing rather than having to wait for us to do that. And then as Andy said, we can always continue the hearing if we need to. And I wanted to see if anybody else was going to bring this up. So I was glad that somebody did in terms of effect on neighboring streets. Mm -hmm. That is definitely something I'm not saying a huge study should be done about now, but we should all be thinking about as to what decision we make in terms of referral or action plus 
future action, et cetera, associated with this, because I will give you the exact example of when we put those lovely speed bumps on Lincoln, the original proposal by a former town manager was to only put them on Lincoln. And the select board said, yeah, I don't think that's gonna work. I think that's gonna have an impact on Blue Hills and Dana. And that's why you see speed bumps on all those places. So there is give and take in terms of the expertise of the staff and what we're hearing from the community and what we've seen as the patterns. But it also doesn't mean we have to get it all fixed at once. But we do need to be aware of those ramifications and what the parking is around that area because exactly as with the speed bumps, we don't want to just push it to the next street so that they, they have to come do the same thing. Are there any other comments at this time? Shalini? So I just want to clarify. What I'm hearing is that we're going, we want to go ahead with this hearing, but then, and the larger question of how do we address our constituents' problems, and some of them, as Darcy mentioned, are really serious. Like here, you can't really go very high speed on Lincoln because of the parking, so I'm imagining the risk is lower versus what we've been hearing with the accidents happening in South Amherst. So in our minds, there are certain areas that have really high risk. And so we are waiting to have that discussion later, or should we be taking a cue from what's happening now and reach out to our residents and say, come to uh, town council and request a hearing? They, I just want to be clear. This did not start out as a request directly to us. It started out as a discussion with actually the district counselors, then a discussion with the town manager, and I don't know of, of all the meetings that took place. So it's not as if they just stood in front of us one night and said, could we have a hearing on this? So it's, it's been months, it, months. right. So it, again, I would prefer that we have the 150 or 200 signatures and maybe that's a good way to go. Yes, Dorothy. To get that many, since this is a, a uh, the houses have large lots, you would have to go to the Lincoln uh, Court Apartments, which are gonna be demolished, and ask graduate students to sign it. Um, because the reason he, he got the signatures that could be got, on the street. Now, we could say, okay, go take it, go get a table at the farmer's market and just get other people because there was a letter from a woman who doesn't live anywhere nearby but uses that street to get to UMass every day who said, when are you going to fix that? This is just terrible accidents waiting to, to happen. And she did write a letter and it's in the packet. So there are people beyond those who live on Lincoln who are very distressed about the safety concerns. The reality is that the charter requirement for signatures is that you must be a voter. You can be a voter and live any place else in Amherst, but all you have to do to sign a petition is be a voter. Okay, so yes, that person could have signed this petition. Pat. I call the question. Okay. There's no, no question to call I, yet. Would you like to make the motion? I would like to make a motion, if I may. I would like to move that we authorize the president to call a public hearing on the date of March 9th at our next meeting to, do, to address the issue of Lincoln parking and uh, that uh, she share with uh, the town manager some of the concerns, which I'm sure he's very well aware of, um, the concerns that have been raised this evening, some of the questions that staff. Um, okay. Sorry. There, that there's a motion written here. There's one in the packet? Yes. How nice. Yes. <laughs> I kind of like my motion. Uh, your motion included the word parking, and therefore I, mean, I think Athena has Alyssa no idea would like is. that motion. Um, so uh, move, I'm going to be George for okay. a second. Go Moved ahead. that the council president schedule a March 9th, 2020 legally noticed public hearing in accordance with the town general bylaws section 3.14B on the proposed changes to the public way reg ways regulations on Lincoln Avenue as Presented. Is there a second? I second it. Any further discussion? At this I thought time? I was pretty close. You were. <laughs> and you included the word parking. <laughs> yes. 
Um, Darcy. I guess Darcy. I, I'm probably going to vote against this just because I feel like we should have a policy and if we if if we are going to have many, many hearings about traffic and safety issues, they should all fulfill the same criteria. So it seems like this is being requested because the residents asked for it without having fulfilled the requirements of the charter. Um, and I don't think that's a good precedent. Can I, may I also add that GOL has already been charged with coming up with that process. GOL has already been asked to come up with that process that you're asking for. So yes, we are, we're aware of that. Yes, Andy Jo. So I just want to emphasize that while this has been something that we've heard a lot about from residents, the actual proposal on the table has come and been generated from our own town staff. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's, that's one of the ways we get public ways changes presented to us um, is from town staff. We've done a couple today. One was a public ways easement that came from town staff, but was really request started with a request from a resident, right. but ultimately came from town staff. Um, and so the fact that this is a town staff proposal now, to me, makes a bit of a difference as to why we can move forward with the public hearing. Shalini. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, really I, I, have to just I, I, say, we've exhausted this one. We have, but what's us difficult position because we have been in discussion with uh, with our constituents mm -hmm. f for a year now with very serious implications. We've had staff, and I, all I'm saying is that, I mean, what do we go back and say to them? You know, because they have, we've also been having this discussion. I feel we've been misled or we, we've been misleading our uh, constituents about what the process is. We were trying to handle it. We got the staff involved. And maybe if we have an understanding of why the staff then cho is choosing this versus mm -hmm. the other. I mean, it's just that we're at a loss of explo explaining to people. Right. I understand the, the predicament that you're in, and I also understand that this is why we've asked GOL to look at it. Because we all have these issues. Pat and I have them in our district up and down the whole place. So it's it's not you're not alone. Okay. Dorothy. I do think that we don't want to get so that we all say but I have something too. We all have something. We all we have been doing a great job of working together as a council, and we have been all been listening to our constituents and working with our constituents. And I, I think we really should not let ourselves be pitted against each other. I think we have to think about the town safety, and as we do it, we're working through the processes that we don't have, and they're getting clarified as we speak. Alyssa. I really appreciate that GOL has had this on their agenda and is certainly going to be working on it again after all this input associated with this because we do need a process. It's absolutely true. But again, to really emphasize, this is a staff proposal. I'm sorry that staff talked to lots of people about lots of things and didn't get as far as making a proposal thus far, and that can probably be addressed in the process that George is talking about for GOL. But this is not the Lincoln neighbors proposal. This is a staff proposal in response to concerns they raised, and there should be additional staff proposals, In reg I would argue. I do not want to force every single person to go out and collect all those signatures because what that does is that forces our hand. When they do that, then we right. have to say, okay, now we're going to have to work on this one next because that's the squeakiest wheel. And so I think that's one of the things that GOL is trying to work out is how to not have it just be based on this random squeaky wheel sort of thing, but how to actually have a process that doesn't necessarily force people to just say, well, forget that. I'm just going to go and get the signatures and force them to act. Right. 
Perhaps GOL would like further input on all that. We always welcome input from our fellow counselors. Thank you. Um, and I have something to say about that later this evening. But I would welcome any kind of, uh, uh, obviously just to me only, but I would welcome any input on this issue. Uh, we will be taking it up on Wednesday. Um, yeah, if we're, if we're lucky, because we have a very, very full agenda. But it is on the agenda. There's a question on the council. It's been made, a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Further comments or discussion? Shalini. Could we ask the staff to explain to us what the, the process was for them to choose this over the others then? Or I is that not, is this not the time? Let's start with getting our policy and then figure out with the town manager the process since our, recommend, our questions always go to the town manager. He decides then how to bring staff in. Okay. No. Motions on the floor. It's been made and seconded. Any further conversation or discussion at this time? All right. All those in favor of the motion, which is that the town council pres that the council president schedule a March 9, 2020 legally notice public hearing in accordance with the town general bylaws section 3.14b on the proposed changes to public ways regulations on Lincoln Avenue as presented. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. I'm sorry. Did you, yeah. What are we doing? Like, show, you want to do it again? Let's start over. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Okay, so it is 12 4. No, it can't be. It can't I'm be. sorry. Yeah. Even I'm I know sorry. that. You, can't you were opposed. Be. I didn't see you. Athena, what was the vote? Please tell me what the vote I need to know. That was nine in favor and three opposed. Nine in favor and three opposed. Thank you. And one absent. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are going to break and we are going to go into executive session at this time and we will come back out of executive session, I would say in approximately 20, 30 minutes and continue with our agenda as presented. Okay. This commissioners has an ability to adopt regulations and then they have the ability to enforce those regulations. Um, but one enforcement mechanism that they can adopt but not actually enforce on their own is a non-criminal disposition, which is fines essentially. Um, so they can adopt a regulation, um, and they've adopted two regulations, one of which is bring your own bottle regulations, and another one is alcohol food service regulations. They can adopt them. They can say we would like to have as one of our enforcement options fines, um, but they cannot enforce those fines unless under our bylaws the council approves the regulations at the current time. So these, the BYOB regulations were adopted by the Board of Licensed Commissioners on July 29th. The alcohol food service regulations were adopted by the Board of Licensed Commissioners on September 23rd. Um, I am proposing these motions to approve those regulations because I think it would be good for them to be able to enforce them in all the ways they thought penalty-wise was appropriate when they adopted the regulations, including non-criminal disposition. Um, that, I, that's the basic behind why I'm proposing this. Um, the, the bylaws, right now, the reason we have to do it is the section 2.2b that just went into effect. Um, <coughs> It says the non-criminal method for disposition may also be used pursuant to this article for violations of any rule or regulation of any municipal officer, board, or department, which is subject to a specific penalty, provided that the town council shall first approve by majority vote 
each rule or regulation to be enforced by this procedure. Um, my intention is not for us to debate the merits of the regulation. The Board of License Commissioners has already adopted them. They are already in effect. Um, these are not bylaw changes, these motions. Um, that is, they have those abilities. It would be essentially to say, yes, non-criminal disposition is an allowable penalty under these regulations. Okay, so, so item D, the Board of License Commissioners regulations, this is a first discussion. However, you as a council have the option of referring this uh, to refer Board of License Commissioner regulations non-criminal disposition pursuant to general bylaw section 2.2B, BYOB, bring your own bottle, and alcohol food service to the, G, to the Governance Organization and Legislative Committee with a report back to the Town Council on a date specified. So we can either have this as a first reading and it will come back on next, um, a, the next agenda or we can choose tonight to go ahead and refer to GOL. Evan. I have an opinion. Yes. Um, I, <clears throat> no to GOL. I, I don't think it's, it's, it's necessary. I think this is a, a fairly straightforward thing. Uh, right now, we, there are regulations that are in place. There is no way for them to enforce them non-criminally. I would hope that we could agree that the regulations shouldn't be enforced criminally um, for things like, you know, violating BYOB regulations. Um, I actually don't need, this might be hypocritical in light of things I've said in the past, don't even think we need a first reading of this. I, to me, this is pretty clear cut and I look forward to someone telling me why it's not. Um, but I would be also willing to, since we've already done it six other times tonight, uh, suspend five, five other <laughs> times tonight, uh, suspend rule 8.4 um, and, and give the BLC sort of the authority that they're seeking from us. Okay, so your first motion is? You move to suspend? Suspend. Uh, I would love, before I make that motion, to hear if there are real reasons not to do so, but then I would happily make that motion. Mandy Joe, I would love for it to just be passed tonight so it doesn't have to come back, but I did not propose that because I did not know where this council stood and I recognize we have rule 8.4 that requires a first discussion before we vote. But if the council's willing to just vote tonight, okay. that'd be fantastic. Kathy? Um, I think what Evan just proposed makes total sense when I read this and when I heard Doug talk last time, I thought we should just move this quickly through and particularly, um, I think it, Mandy wrote a very nice clear memo and if this went back to GOL, Mandy's on, GOL <laughs> would review what she wrote and said, oh, likely clear, consistent, and actionable, and then we, then we get it back again. So I think we don't need to refer it. You know, I mean, I think we, we have pretty simply worded wording here um, rather than, if we were writing the regulations, I would feel differently about it, but we're, we're allowing an enforcement tool. All right, is there a motion to suspend rule a procedure 8.4 with regard to item 7D? I so move. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion on that dis item? No. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right, now I need someone to craft the motion. Okay, Mandy Jo. So for it's it. for Athena's purposes, it is in my memorandum on the BLC yep. regulations memo. There are two motions in that memo. Um, and I'm just going to read the first one. Moved pursuant to general bylaws section 2.2B, 
the town council hereby approves the Amherst Board of License Commissioners BYOB Bring Your Own Bottle regulations adopted by the Board of License Commissioners on July 29, 2019, including all amendments thereto subsequently adopted for enforcement by non-criminal disposition by the Board of License Commissioners with penalties as set forth in the regulations. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? And all those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12 zero, zero, and one absent. So there's okay. one more then. And now we're going to move on no, to the there's, next. There's, there's one more motion. motion. Yeah, the second one. Go so, ahead. So um, moved pursuant to general bylaw section 2.2B, the town council hereby approves the Amherst Board of License Commissioners alcohol food service regulations adopted by the Board of License Commissioners on September 23rd, 2019, including all amendments thereto subsequently adopted for enforcement by non-criminal disposition by the Board of License Commissioners with penalties as set forth in the regulations. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 12 zero, zero. Okay. Um, the bylaw. So thank you all for doing that so quickly. Um, I am proposing a, an amendment to the bylaw that we just had to approve these regulations under so that in the future we do not have to approve these regulations if the Board of License Commissioners or the Board of Health or some other board adopts regulations and they desire to have them enforced by non-criminal disposition, that would happen automatically. That would not require council approval. Um, so that bylaw amendment is on page, the proposed that amendment that I'm making is on page four of the memo that I submitted. And basically I went through and, and found a number of different towns, um, including Spring, West Springfield, Westfield, Somerville, Cambridge, Northampton, there's a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. um, the memo indicates what most of that language generally was that corresponds to our section 2.2b. Um, I took that language and modified our section 2.2b accordingly, but I added um, some additional language, the currently existing or hereafter adopted that was in one of those cities um, corresponding section. It basically removes the provided that the town council shall first approve by majority vote each rule or regulation to be enforced by this procedure, um, and then just clarifies some of the other ones. Um, but essentially, we'd be getting rid of the clause that requires us to vote to approve each of the regulations adopted in order for them to enforce it non-criminally, which would mean we don't have to keep track of when, say, the Board of License Commissioners adopts new regulations to then bring it back to us for approval. It would just happen automatically. Um, is there discussion about this? This is an automatic refer referral to GOL because it's a bylaw. So, but before we send it off to GOL, are there discussion? I just have a comment. I appreciate having local towns included for comparables. I, I guess the only other thing is that I think it was useful for the public to understand that these regulations have happened with the Board of License Commission. And so I'd just like to make sure that we figure out in passing this bylaw how that's publicly communicated. Because it all of a sudden they pop up and somebody says, well, when did that happen? So any other discussion before it goes off to GOL? Alyssa. I think it, it GOL wanted to make a recommendation based on how we have set up other new things on our town website since town councils come into existence mm -hmm. in terms of that section that has our rules, for example. Mm -hmm. If we could do a similar thing for Board of Health regulations, Board of License Commissioner regulations, and probably one I haven't even thought of, but those being the main two because people do not realize if they haven't served here, that right. they get to do what they want, largely. And we're further enabling that, which is fine, because they still largely get to do what they want, but people ought to be able to find it easily. Mm -hmm. And so there might just be a way, they, 
given our previous experience with organizing materials, that might be a good recommendation to come back out. Okay. Anything else? Okay. That's an automatic referral. So then we're going to move on to the affordable housing priorities policy. And let me just point out that the affordable housing, Amherst Affordable Housing Trust presented a draft policy to the council. It's in your packet. It's dated July 19th, 2019. After discussion among the council, it was referred to CRC, Community Resources Committee, and to the Finance Committee. Both of these standing committees have held several discussions, um, had public comment, and gone back and held even more discussions about this policy. And they've prepared their reports to reflect this for tonight. So I'm gonna call on Aunt Mandy Joe to summarize community resources and Andy to summarize finance committee. And then we'll move to discussion. Mandy Joe. So the original referral was to provide feedback to the town council on the priorities plan policy. Um, and we did that in a extensive memo um, on November 13th, 2019. After that, the finance committee took up the referral and then let me know as chair that their recommendation was going to be to do a holistic um, sort of referral back on housing policy in general to a committee of the council. And so on January 29th, the CRC revisited the recommendation and the feedback. Um, and after a robust discussion, we voted four to one um, with Pat was, was the one in the no to recommend that the council refer the CRC to CRC the development of a comprehensive housing policy for the town of Amherst as a priority, taking into consideration the trust's draft policy in order to make recommendations to the full council. The as a priority is in there was um, to indicate that it should be a priority to get a housing policy back to the council um, so it doesn't sit on CRC's agenda. Um, the no vote, uh, Pat can speak f more fully to this, but she believed that a delay in drafting a comprehensive policy would leave the town without an affordable housing policy in the interim, and that would potentially harm development of affordable housing. And so she felt that adopting an affordable housing policy before a comprehensive policy was vitally important and therefore disagreed with a full referral back to for a comprehensive policy development when we had a draft affordable housing policy on the table that could be continued to work on by the trust. Um, okay. Is there any further comment from CRC at this point? Pat, or anything? No, okay. Andy? Well, we've had a series of robust discussions that I have reported to you in writing on several different occasions, including for this meeting. And um, I don't want to take the time at this hour to go into lengthy discussion of what the financial implications are. I think that what we basically learned is <clears throat> that there are um, costs that have to be assessed each time a proposal is made to develop um, some affordable housing. We've had some great successes in the town, have learned a lot from them, <clears throat> including the fact that there could be, in addition to un outgoing costs, um, staff costs. There could also be great benefits, as we sometimes find when um, the uh, state uh, through DCHD is willing to, um, has a grant program that would support it. And each needs to be assessed on its own merits. We think that the uh, council will do that and that that's what the council, one of the council's responsibilities is, happened on, with the Northampton Road discussion. Um, so that Basically, uh, we were feeling that 
uh, the policy was going, was taking us in a direction that was um, helpful, um, but that uh, it really needed to have substantial additional work done about how some of those provisions are worded so that it comes out right and serves the community's interests. Um, one of the other um, things that you received, I think, was the uh, December 2017 report from the planning department about all of the recent projects over that are discussed. And uh, the reason I want to point that out is that uh, it really is a demonstration that we have done a lot. We have had great success. We are not going to stop that the lack of the, po that the policy creation isn't going to stop us from seizing opportunities that come up when we have opportunities and that um, the important thing is to have the right policy. And I think that's basically what the basis of the recommendation is. All right. So let me comment before we go into the discussion of the motion. And that is that um, on several occasions, this council has discussed housing. They've discussed it not just from the affordable uh, housing perspective, but also from issues like workforce housing, middle class income housing, uh, middle income housing, and et cetera. Um, in, in fact, to the point that when we first drafted a set of goals, which we never adopted, the words comprehensive housing a policy actually appear in those goals. A second thing is that regardless of what we want to do here, we do need to consider the staff time because the very same staff that would work on this are also involved in master plan and in bylaw, in bylaw review. And then finally, um, I, I need to track this down further, but I do want to mention that when I was at the full count kickoff thing last Friday, um, I believe it was a person from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission mentioned that they had just contracted with a certain institute at the university that I'm familiar with, um, which I have not had a chance to track down, uh, that they are going to do a comprehensive housing study of the Pioneer Valley. So I think we need to find out about that. I think we need to figure out whether there's ways that we can gain information from that study and the timing of that study. So um, I just wanted to lay out those additional pieces of information for the council. So the, the recommendation here is that we refer uh, the community resources report, the finance committee uh, resources report, and we refer all of this back to the, and the policy, draft policy, to the community resources committee and to develop a comprehensive housing policy and again, I don't know what kind of time frame we want to put on that, but in a later discussion, we'll be looking at the net, the time, essentially the approach, the proposed approach for the master plan revisions, but also um, after that is bylaw. So the idea really is at this point, with great appreciation for the Affordable Housing Trust for bringing this forward, is to recognize that we live this commitment every day in Amherst um, to affordable housing, but we also want to look at all of our comprehensive housing issues. Further discussion? Darcy. Um, if, if this were referred to the CRC, um, does that assume that um, there will be a separate housing policy created separate from our, what's being plan, put in the master plan? Um, and are we, you know, are we going to be responsive to the target numbers that the housing trust put in their proposal? Because um, I don't see that necessarily happening in a policy document or a master plan. Um, so I have those questions. I think one of the reasons it would go to CRC is because they're, they're engaged in the conversation about the master plan, and also they would have to look at 
I mean, it, it's kind of sending it to the committee that is already looking at master plan and is looking at um, the comprehensive nature. I, I don't think we can answer that question completely because we're not exactly telling them everything we want them to do, but that's one of the things you would want to make sure happens. Andy? A large part of the concern that is expressed in the Finance Committee report is that um, there are benefits to having a concrete goal. There are also some um, extreme concerns about having a concrete goal and that uh, we laid them out in the report and suggested that that's a subject that needs to be determined with a little bit of study from CRC. Uh, we didn't feel it was appropriate to make the decision or make a recommendation, but we did feel it um, on the bottom line, but we did feel it was important that um, that be considered because if you have a concrete goal and the concrete in the goal drives the um, decision making down the line, uh, then there are consequences that come about. Uh, I think the other thing that I just would add um, that I did receive a uh, um, memorandum from by email today from Mr. Hornick is chair of the uh, Affordable Housing Trust. And uh, he said that he was not going to come to tonight's meeting because he was perfectly um, fine with working with um, CRC if that was a decision made. So I feel comfortable conveying that information along. Hey, Darcy, I just want to go back because I think what I heard from you is you want the committee, CRC, to look at this and in relationship to the master plan and the goals that were proposed. Yeah, I'm just Darcy. trying to figure out what it is the CRC is going to do. And um, I, the master plan process is going to unfold over a period of, what, 10 months to a year type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this would be integrated into that process and that would be the time frame that we might be getting a result about this in, right? Yeah, Shalini. Um, um, I have two questions, and I feel like that's something, shouldn't the town council be in agreement about, we, A, where do we stand with respect to homeless people? Like, do we have a policy about that? And is that something CRC is going to determine, or is that something the town council has to come up with, like what is our position on that? What are our goals or vision for that? And secondly, in, like we have limited resources and we can't provide housing for everyone who needs housing. So again, is that a priority that as a council we need to come up with? Like can, can we have like a really strong goal that Every working family, like you know, or something like working families, is our priority, and we want to provide affordable housing. We want to make sure that at least the people who are working here uh, have a house. Or is it, I don't know, eighty percent, you know, below median? So is that something that the town council has to come up with, and then the CRC works on how to make it happen, or? I would hope it would be just the reverse because I don't think the town council is going to sit here and actually draft a policy. I think that what I'm hearing from you though is that you would like whatever they come back with to also address homelessness and also address priorities and goals. Okay. Other comments? Okay, yes, Alyssa. One of the frustrations I'm, I'm having here beyond just the oddity of CRC referring it back to itself is the fact that this is the kind of thing that in the past we frequently would have hired someone to do. Mm -hmm. And so referencing what you said about PVC, I don't even want to say it because I'm not happy with most of the things they provide to us. So that agency and also um, the work we're doing on the master plan and the fact that staff and 
we'll have a different discussion about the master plan and how unhappy I am about that process. But I, I'm not clear on how we're going to manage all this. I mean, this feels like something that could literally be all of CRC's time, all of the time, with to the exclusion of everything else in order to manage this. And so I, I'm been working on affordable housing for years, so it's not like I have a problem with having a policy. I'm just trying to figure out maybe what makes sense is to refer to CRC so they come back to us and say what's realistic. I, mm -hmm. Maybe that mm -hmm. is why a referral would be something I could support because CRC would say, okay, now that we've thought about this, we've looked at other people's, et cetera, we're realizing given where we are in the master plan, this is what we're gonna tell town council as opposed to they're gonna have a finished thing for us on such and such a date. Additional comments? Well, I would just say that there is a the long learning curve, but um, everybody can't be going, learning the same things at once. And um, I'm going to the planning board, the zoning subcommittee, the ZBA, the local historic district and there's one other. Um, and, you know, we just trying to get a picture of what Amherst has, what it needs, where it's going. And, and you know, Shalini, the workforce housing is really a, something that's big on people's minds. But it's the idea of, um, I mean, obviously some, some research will have to be done. But, you know, where is the town going in terms of its, um, who's moving in? What kind of a balance are we going to have between renter and owner, between family and student? Those are, those are major topics. And I, I see that the CRC working on this policy doesn't mean that they make the policy, okay? That they're trying to put together some kind of proposal which then the council will spend a good deal of time on. Can I, um, I'm going to actually go back on something Alyssa's suggested, and that is, Perhaps the motion is not for CRC to develop the policy, but it's to recommend an approach for the development of a policy that takes into consideration all the other things that are on the table. And they may come back and say, you know, we suggest that there be budget money put aside for this, or we suggest there be a ad hoc committee for this, or we suggest that this be something we face or we try to do over this period of time versus this period of time. But um, it, it kind of gets at the issue of how are we gonna do this? Just the same way we said, how are we gonna do the master plan? And now we have before us a proposal on how to approach the master plan. Does that, Mindy Jo, your, your chair of CRC. <laughs> Steve's on CRC. Pat's on CRC, Andy's on CRC, and Dorothy, right. I mean, given CRC's vote, there, I surmise there would be at least one vote against such a change to the motion because it would delay even longer getting to a policy if the first thing CRC has to do is come up with a process on how to develop a policy. Um, Andy, in the CRC meeting, when we, re, you know, when we considered the finance committee recommendation, um, made the point that the council is the policy making chief policy setter in the town. Um, and a policy adopted by the council becomes a town policy, whereas a policy adopted by a board or committee becomes that board's or committee's policy. Um, and so if we're seeking to create a housing policy for this town, the council needs to adopt that policy and the logical place for it to be first vetted is a committee of the council. 
um, how that committee vets or develop its, develops it should probably be left up to that committee. That doesn't mean the committee would start from scratch. Um, you know, I haven't as chair thought about how we might go about figuring out how to do it if this referral comes to us to develop a comprehensive housing policy. Um, we in CRC talked about how we would absolutely need to um, work with the experts in town to do so, including the housing trust um, and potentially other places and, and committees and staff to figure stuff out, but we'd also probably look towards other towns to see if they have housing policies and how those look um, and maybe start with a template from there. Um, it hasn't been thought of, but to add in, we can't develop the policy, we have to develop a process first, seems like adding extra work to the council's load because it has to come back to the council to approve before you can then start the policy. Okay. Darcy. So, Mandy Joe, do you foresee that the CRC can do all of that um, on its own without like help from an outside consultant or um, because you know, we have in the ECAC, we're going to be coming up with our climate action plan and we now have grant money to pay a consultant to help us do that. Um, it just seems like it's a massive amount of work and I'm just wondering if you're planning on doing it all, Mandy Jo. <laughs> so I, I think it, I, I don't know is the answer um, because I think it depends on what in the end CRC decides on what the policy should look like and whether it's just goals. The, for example, ECAC came up with goals with some staff support, but not the implementation, the plan to implement those goals. Um, if that's where the policy's going, then that can probably be done within CRC and consulting others. I, like I said, I haven't thought tremendously extensively about how this might look within the committee. Um, if it's going to be really specific down to numbers of units and and things like that, then maybe it, it can't be. But until CRC's looked into and talked about, if it comes to CRC, talked about what the policy parameters they want to present to the council are, and parameters is more like, when I say that, the extensiveness of the policy, I, I can't really answer how the development of that might go. The first part of the discussion would be what type of policy, where's our goal setting going? You know, is it very general? Is it very specific? All, all sorts of things like that. So uh, rather than spend a whole lot more time on how this is going to get done, I think the general idea is that it would go to CRC and they may come back and say, we like the assistance in the following way, or they may say, here's the plan we're using, or they may say, here's the policy. Yep. So the motion, if we have it, is to refer the Community Resources Committee report dated 2-4-2020, the Finance Committee report appendices titled Finance Committee Housing Policy Report and Affordable Housing Town Support and the proposed Amherst Affordable Housing Priorities Policy to the Community Resources Committee to develop a comprehensive housing policy with report to the Council on a date yet to be specified. Is there a motion? I, I would move that. A second? I second. Can and the date be 90 days? Sure, because you have to report in 90 days, okay? So there's a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay, yes? 
It's a motion on it's the motion on the motion sheet and, and all I've done is fill out yeah. within ninety days. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Yes, Andy. I actually have a uh, question for Athena. Um, I didn't see it was when I looked at the SharePoint package just now, I didn't see the um, Finance Committee report. It feels. We'll make sure it's added. Yeah, I think that's at this point, if it's not there, it needs to be added. Because the the numbering uh, sometimes makes things difficult, but I, I'm fairly sure it's there. If it's not, I'll make sure it's there. Okay. All right. If, even if it's not there, the motion assumes it exists. <laughs> there it is. Well, uh, January, is this it? Yep, Andy? that's it. I think I've got it in the past. Yeah, I did the day. January 28th. Before you had draft on it and DDD or something. This now says January 28th. It's under 7H. It might have been a link that you had to push. In the okay. All right, so there's a motion on the floor. It's been made and seconded. The only amendment so far to that motion is, not amendment, it was a friendly amendment, is that the council would, that the CRC would report to the council within 90 days. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Twelve zero zero. Okay, we're moving on to master plan process. Mandy Jo. So this is a slightly revised version of the process that was presented, I think, two meetings ago. Um, it was revised in response to feedback that was received by the planning board, um, by planning board members. Um, the revisions were voted unanimously at CRC to recommend the town council adopt the process as amended at the January 29th meeting as its process for working toward adoption of the master plan as required by Charter Section 9.8. The main revision, the revisions are marked in red on page six of the CRC report. Um, the main revision was there was concern that the phrase changes in town priorities since the approval of the master plan was very vague um, and could be construed very extensively. And so we pulled, deleted that, um, pulled out the climate action goals from the town adoption of plans, initiatives, and goals because it was the only goal under that listing and put that in the place of the phrase that said changes in town priorities and just said the council's adoption of the climate action goals. Um, the other big, the only other change really was the six months to nine months to extend the time period for it. It is my understanding that on um, last Wednesday, the planning board adopted their own process for um, updating the master plan. There is a flow chart, if Athena could put the flow chart up. Yeah. Um, that I created. I do not know, I haven't gotten updated as to whether the process that I sort of set forth in the big box that has yellow. But um, this just shows the, just, yep, that first one, it just shows the process. We're at the first box on the top right, which is adopting this process that's in this memo. Um, and then it would then essentially forward to the town manager, forward to the planning board that we'd asked this. They've already adopted that they're going to update it. So we're kind of already past the second box too. And we're into the planning board process where the green arrows are. Their process is a potential draft process is outlined there. I, I do not know whether that is what they're going to follow. During that process, they would be in con communication with CRC. We would be in communication with you. Um, once they get to a final draft of the master plan update, it would come back to the council for referral to CRC. Um, and then 
CRC along with the council would look at those updates, would make any recommended feedback, change, you know, have feedback, any recommended changes if we have any, all of that. The council would vote on any of that to send back to the planning board. They'd go through their process again. Um, they'd vote on the final master plan update. That would then come through the town manager per the charter to the council. The council would then hold the required public hearing under the charter. We are in the green arrow now, which represents the required charter part. Um, and then the council would adopt the master plan after having held the public hearing at a meeting after the public hearing is held. Um, and so that flowchart was in your packet too. And hopefully that helps illustrate what this wording kind of says. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Dorothy. Some some of the some of the feedback um, from the planning board was that they hope that the part of the beginning where you see the planning board and a green arrow going down and a green arrow going back to the big box on the right is that that's where the majority of, of changes would happen. Um, they were less interested in some of the last loops of back and forth um, because uh, stating that it was a, their prerogative and we did clarify what you have clarified that um, we don't have to adopt it for it to be the town's plan. The planning board makes the, the master plan. But I would say that there was general agreement with the diagram. Um, some people were a little upset about the placement of the public hearing and you know that's in the charter but the point is they're going to have public hearings before that and we have to do ours we'll do it but they want public input much earlier as I'm sure we do too so I, I would say that they, it's you've done a pretty good job of, of getting uh, a, a workable plan further comments Alyssa Never in my wildest dreams did I imagine after six years on the Comprehensive Planning Committee, three of them as chair, that we'd be talking about this at this point after 11 o'clock, 10 years after the planning board adopted the master plan and never created a master plan implementation committee. That we're now talking about a process where we're going to spend nearly a year reviewing a document that's already in existence, but without any additional staff help, without any additional money, but it's somehow gonna magically be worked into planning board meetings, additional public hearings, both the required one here and the planning board trying to encourage people. It's going to attract an incredibly tiny subset of people to pay attention over the next nine months because it's not the quarter million dollar plus master plan that we wrote. It's simply a revision. And I appreciate that we're trying to balance all these concerns I still don't understand why we aren't simply voting to accept the master plan that we have right now and then talking to the planning board about how they're going to make revisions to the plan and how we can talk to them. I think it's crazy that we're concerned about going through and changing the words from select board to whatever, that we're worried about whether or not we've included the name of every single plan in a 10-year-old plan. We know that we're in the cycle every 20 years. We need to be doing this. I don't understand why we're gonna to go to this much work and then have to redo our master plan because we are. This isn't going to fix, this isn't gonna prevent us from needing to revise the master plan within the next 10 years. So I'm just at a loss as to why this is a sensible use of staff time, financial resources we don't have. The reason we don't have a master plan implementation committee is because no one had time to staff it or to be on it. <laughs> and so I, I'm just not really getting what this accomplishes for us. I feel like we could easily have just voted to adopt the master plan that exists and then started having CRC talk to the planning board about, hey, I really think we should work on the housing section or I really think we need to work on the, the sustainability section and then we would be making progress toward updating the master plan itself rather than this sort of halfway revision that takes longer than a month. Dorothy. Okay. Well, I think that the last discussion at the planning board 
includes a lot of the things that you're talking about. Um, there was definitely a desire which grew as they talked to f form an implementation committee and to be thinking of it. Um, they used an image of a basket. When they came to something that was not as simple, not immediate, but really necessary, that wouldn't, but, but would not be included in what we call the um, necessary and obvious uh, update, they would put it in this basket, but it doesn't mean that the basket just sits there, okay? That they would be starting to work on the areas that were mo longer and more involved. Um, because I think, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think we were supposed to be looking at updates every five years, and obviously we haven't done that. So I would say that the planning board um, is more or less on with, the, with this project of a limited update. Uh, while they are getting themselves going on thinking about the next, you know, the, the real update that's going to have to happen within what, the next five years, is it? Yeah. No, 10. You have to, you have to do it every 40, every 20 years and we're halfway through. Um, other comments at this time? So, yes, Evan? Maybe I missed this, <clears throat> but I, I, I'm having trouble reconciling the fact that we're looking at small updates that are necessary, which I support with the nine month time period. And I understand that planning board has a lot on their plate. Their meetings have been running uh, sometimes almost as long as our meetings have been running. Um, and, and so I, I understand that, but I think f from an optics perspective saying we're not doing a major overhaul, we're just doing minor updates and then saying, and it's going to take us nine months, it's, it's hard to reconcile those two things. So I, I'd love to hear a little bit more. I have, uh, they set themselves a schedule in which they um, set aside meetings where they would take um, maybe an hour or maybe more than that, a good, a good part of the meeting on different sections of the master plan, and there were so many sections of the master plan, and they did, that's how they got that nine months. So they're building in, carrying on their regular load, which is heavy, um, and putting in study sessions where, where this town staff will help them, and it seemed to me everyone was on board with that. Mandy Joe. The other concern with six months was that would put us in the middle of summer, and they were really concerned about holding many of the public hearings in the middle of summer and all the public outreach potentially in the middle of summer. Um, so that nine months while it's there, there's a recognition that it might not actually take that long. There could be potential time where it's done, but sitting to try and get some public outreach so it's not done when no one's here or it's not done in the middle of budget season um, from our point of view or something like that where there's uh, to try and schedule those hearings at a more appropriate time during the course of the year. Um, so it's, it's not all a, it's going to take us nine months to get this to you. It, there's a hope that it's not going to. It's part of their timing themselves, not necessarily that it's extensive, it's just it needs to fit into their schedule, but also they're not, they're also, as long as we probably would be hesitant calling a public hearing on the master plan in the middle of July. Um, um, one other thing to take into consideration is the charter requirement that we have a form every year on the master plan. We did do that in 2019 on September 28th. And so the fall timing of trying to get up to the next public forum for that would also be consistent. Um, there's a motion, I'm gonna read it, and let's see whether we're willing to go ahead. And it's to adopt the process for updating and adopting the master plan as set forth in the document titled CRC Proposed Master Planning Pro Plan Process 2020-02-4 as recommended by the Community Resources Committee as presented, <coughs> excuse me, as presented. Is there a motion? 
So moved. Is there a second? Second. Is there further discussion? Darcy. I guess my reaction to this is um, that, you know, f considering the, the, the responsibility for coming up with a master plan resides in the planning board, this, um, I, I can understand why the planning board had, um, at least some members had a reaction of wondering why we were trying to control the process so much. Um, and I, I am wondering the same thing. Um, is it that we don't trust the planning board to do the job? Um, I guess it feels, it feels very um, unnecessary to me, the, this process, or this whole flow chart. Um. Dorothy? Um, well, what, what happened was the CRC was having sessions on the master plan. And we had a lot of other things to do, too. So now we're not going to be having sessions month, chapter by chapter on the master plan. But the planning board is doing it. So I would say that the planning board, when they saw the original plan, said the master plan is ours. Okay, we understand that the council has to, well, has to adopt it. Well, it has to accept it. That's what it is. But they, they feel now that they're in charge of the um, revision, and we will have input as you will have input. <coughs> yes. Indy Joe. So, sorry. This all stems from the fact that the charter, that green section at the bottom of this flowchart, is required. We, as a town council, must adopt the master plan. Um, <coughs> per the charter. <coughs> the planning board has to approve a master plan per the charter. Um, CRC, it, it, there's, there's some fine arguments for just adopting it without amendment. CRC, when starting with that question, made a recommendation to say, no, that's not what we would recommend to the council, hence this process. But so if the council has to adopt what the, ma what the planning board approves, the whole point of getting to this flowchart, essentially, um, was to figure out how that process could go as smooth as possible because there was concern that if there's no communication between the planning board and the council while the planning board is making changes to the master plan, that when it comes to us under the green box, suddenly the council may say, well, I want to amend it here, and I want to amend it here, and I want to amend it here. And then you've adopted, and then you make those amendments, and the council's adopted something that the planning board didn't pass. And that, under state law, creates many, many problems. So the goal of this flowchart and the process is to get to the green section so that when you get to the green section, when you get to the point where the planning board has adopted the master plan and it comes to the council, the planning board's approved the master plan and it comes to the council for adoption per the charter, that that goes as smoothly as possible. And the way to do that from the point of view of CRC, hence this recommendation, is to have those conversations in that feedback loop prior to the planning board actually approving the master plan. I actually want to refer people to 9.8 section 9.8 of the charter, which is about the master plan. And it, it delineates back and forth between whose responsibility is what. This chart is consistent with that, as best as I can judge that. And it also seems to be laid forth in a spirit of cooperation with each other. Um, and um, so, again, we have a motion on the floor. The motion is... Um, to adopt the process for updating and, and adopting the master plan as set forth in the document titled CRC Proposed Master Plan Process 
02-4 is recommended by the Community Resources Committee as presented. And I want to point out that, in fact, we have to adopt the master plan, not just accept it. There's a difference. Yes. Alyssa. Yes, and adopt the master plan is what it says, and it doesn't say anything about how we can't adopt what we have right now, and I appreciate no. that you referenced right. that earlier. I think the biggest problem we have that this chart is trying to address is the phrase that's in the Charter 9.8b, which says, with or without amendments, which makes no sense because the planning board is responsible for the master plan. So the fact that this is written <clears throat> this way is what is causing us to be all bollocked up like this because we wouldn't have to worry about the town council wanting to amend it if we didn't have the choice about amending it. So that's what you're trying to address by making us talk it through because the charter says with or without amendments which implies that town council could sit here and try and make amendments no matter how many public hearings the planning board had about this. Further discussion? Darcy. Um, I, and and you, I think we might have already covered this. The, the planning board has agreed to this process also, because obviously they need to agree to do it. I believe they did. I mean, so, Andy Joe, do you have? So the planning board about two weeks ago, well, it says February, January 15th, agreed to undertake the up, updating the master plan for necessary and obvious revisions. Um, they have, as of, I believe, last Wednesday, adopted their own process, their internal process, for how they're going to undertake that. Um, Dorothy alluded to some of it. The process that has the box that has some yellow in it is one of the variations they've talked about. I do not know which one they actually adopted. Um, I had a couple of different charts for it. Um, but at, in that, um, they have seen the process outlined in the memo that the motion refers to multiple times, and they have given their feedback to it. Um, and so we did not ask them to adopt that because this part is mostly our part. If you look at it, we did not say how the planning board is going right. to do theirs. We said this is when they're at certain stages of their process, here's how we as a council are going to deal with ours. That's what the purpose of this process is, is how when they're at certain stages, what are we doing? Um, hence, the green arrows are nothing that really applies to us. That's, that's what the planning board sets. The blue arrows are sort of meant for what we set. It, the second page is with the flow chart is the planning, the draft planning board process. Is the, dra is the full draft planning board process. And so we would come in before that, after that at certain stages of that. Okay. Are there other questions at this time? All right, so there's been motions been made and seconded. Any further conversation? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. So we are 11 members of which we have, would you give me the final vote, please? Eight in favor, one opposed, and two abstentions. Okay, thank you, and two absent. Okay, um, we're going on to standing committees. This is not the full proposal. Uh, this is merely a look at and a suggested change of the JCPC charge and the BCG charge. And I believe that, George, this is yours. Yes, it is. Um, my committee uh, has voted uh, to present these to you, changes to JCPC and BCG. We met on January 29th, and both of these were voted. Um, 
JCPC was uh, five zero and uh, BCG was four zero with one absent. And you have in your packet, um, I think it's items seven K one and seven K two are the two charges with red lines. So you can see what changes have been made. Um, in the uh, GOL uh, report, which is also in your packet, I give you a very brief uh, discussion of the of what we talked about <clears throat> in terms of the two changes. So um, these are here for you to um, approve, I hope, but at least uh, you, this is our recommendation for these two charges. I don't think the changes are that dramatic, um, but that's just maybe I've been looking at it too long. Um, but we could start with JCPC, if, if that's appropriate, whatever. So the JCPC, as far as I can see, is changing of the wording, assuming that anybody who's a member of the town council is also current. Mm -hmm. uh, and the only other thing is to reinforce no more than two, and I believe that was to be consistent with what the finance committee charge says. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, in the uh, <clears throat> report, the, 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 uh, we observed that this, the number of, uh, the membership of JPC is three, was a compromise, some councillors wanted four. Um, and there was concern from the committee that having four councillors on the body would be overwhelming to the uh, other members. Right. Um, so we felt three was a reasonable compromise. Right, and if you have three finance committee members of five, there would be that means quorum. every time you have a meeting, yes. you have a quorum of the finance committee. All right, is there any questions about these recommended changes, mostly of which are words? Yes, Alyssa? I'm confused about BCG, as I have been since uh, the day. We're doing JCPC. That, okay, good. Okay. Anything else on JCPC? Why are you crossing out current? Because if you're a member of the school committee, you are current. So it doesn't it mean a past member could not be on it then? That's correct. So it was just redundancy, that's it? That's, yes. It's a bit clear, yeah. Right. Yes, Kathy. I don't really have a question on the JCPC wording, but when I compare it to the BCG wording, mm -hmm. why and when do we say two council members designated by the council X designated by the whatever, which is BCG, and then JCPC. Just do we care whether we, you know, the appointing authority is listed above. It's, they're just, they, they're written in a different way, and I didn't know whether um, there was a strong reason for that, and I think they say the same thing. It's just, you know, one makes it, one is clear that the council is picking whomever is going, and school committee is picking, and the other doesn't. But if you, you go into all the effort of rewriting subtle wording, why are they worded differently? <laughs> Mandy Jo. So the BCG wording is taken pretty much from the charter. The charter, when it talks about BCG, talks about designated buys, designated buys, designated buys, whereas the charter, when it mentions JCPC, doesn't use the word designated by. Um, the appointing authority that we're using in the JCPC charge is through a, a town attorney opinion that said, even though that wording wasn't used in the charter, that the it, it used the word, I think, representatives of those three bodies and the town attorney opinion that came through sometime last year said that meant that the town council appoints that those representatives of the town council so it's it's simply trying to just mirror some of the charter wording mm -hmm. um i just want to recognize we are going back and do, doing council liaisons i'm sorry to skip that you probably didn't even notice i did i figured you're just prioritizing oh okay um so there, on the JCPC charge, is there any further discussion? Could I have a motion, George? Uh, I move. Oh, you, yes, yep, it's on the motion sheet. Okay, Mandy uh, Jo, go ahead. I move to amend the JCPC charge as set forth in the document titled JCPC charge GOL voted 2020-01-29 as recommended by the 2-10-2020 Governance Organization Legislation Committee report as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain. 
Okay, now we're going to go on to BCG and then we'll come back to council liaisons. Excuse me, I'm sorry, BCG. Um, you have in front of you, hopefully with the red line, and uh, as we just pointed out, Manny just pointed out the first change was to bring the charge into conformity with the legal opinion that we got in terms of the reporting authority. It was noted that uh, we were just, well, that I think is just an observation. We're talking about a committee that's required by the charter, but actually is met only once, and at that meeting, all three bodies were present. Um, but the changes are there in front of you. And I have nothing to say. Alyssa had a question. Alyssa? I don't think my question can be solved. I think it's just a bad section of the charter, but it's associated with the idea that the BCG develops coordinated budget guidelines. I bring this up literally every time we talk about BCG. It's not an appropriate task for them to take. It is, however, in the charter. So what's our interpretation of what they're actually practically going to do associated with that? I mean, what are we sending people off to? Because they've met once. Obviously, they are not doing that. They're doing the calendaring thing. They're um, doing the other thing. I have to agree with you. When I read this in the charter, I'm going, eh, I don't think so. But uh, we did we did this this year by having a full meeting of all three bodies, and it was when we did our financial indicators. Someone has suggested to me at the point at which budgets get tight that this is when this group has often been used in the past, and um, other than that, I have no other observation. Mandy Jo. I, I think the wording the under the purpose, the ensures that information is shared amongst those entities as the town manager develops the budget is one of the things that's being added to try and clarify what they might do in mm -hmm. tight budget situations where the manager, obviously the manager is probably talking to the library director and the school superintendent too, but this body at a smaller one instead of calling joint meetings of all three committees could be the way to funnel that information through to each of the elected bodies. Okay. Uh, Kathy. Really have a problem with the rewording this. Do we just ignore the fact that it doesn't really exist as a functioning <laughs> entity? I mean, I'm just saying this because I was, I, I was sort of in theory on this, but I was not on it in terms of it. it but, but you did show up for its one meeting. <laughs> I did show up, but, but we did, it wasn't even officially called by that group. It was everybody on the council and everybody on these other committees. So I understand the charter said this will exist. Do we write all these functions and just uh, ignore the fact that it kind of isn't doing most of these? I think what we do is, at least what I would propose we do, is continue to have finance do any or all of these, and in the process, next time we do the financial indicators, we convene all three boards, and we also call it BCG. I, this is one of those puzzles. said I can, we you could almost tell me any wording on this because I don't think <laughs> it's an entity sure, that actually and you didn't know you, you know, were chair <laughs> right there's no chair <laughs> there's no one no, school committee has never designated a member to it to my knowledge so all right well let's let's do this let's go on to the motion for this um uh, Mandy Jo to amend the BCG charge as set forth in the document titled BCG charge, GOL voted 2020-01-29 as recommended by the February 10th, 2020 Governance Organization Legislation Committee report as presented. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 All those opposed? There are none and there are ab abstain? One abstention? No. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you think that we could figure out what is remaining in our agenda that's critical so that we don't have to go on until 1 a.m.? Uh, I'd certainly like to do that. However, 
we have now been asked by at least one committee to get liaisons moving forward. And so I'd like to address that item in the agenda. Okay. We've only delayed it three times. Yeah, although I, I might have, uh, well, so, so you have a report in your packet. You've had a, this report for well over a month now, so hopefully you've had time to read it and reread it at your leisure. Um, so OCO was tasked um, with essentially dealing with liaisons, and we saw that as sort of uh, three different responsibilities. One, deciding um, why a certain committee should get a liaison while another maybe shouldn't. Uh, two, coming up with a list of committees that we believe should have liaisons. And three, uh, actually recommending appointments to those committees. We have done tasks one and two, um, did these back in December. Uh, so we had a discussion about what criteria we might want to use to decide whether a committee should have a liaison with the understanding that not every committee will or should have a liaison, and that also, uh, an important understanding to this, that not necessarily every counselor needs to be a liaison. We didn't want to say, okay, we have to come up with 13 committees so that every counselor has a liaison. We didn't want to let that cloud of our, our judgment. Uh, we had agreement that any committee that regularly submits to the council um, policies, proposals, bylaws, um, and regularly is a key word there, which is why I emphasized it, uh, should have a liaison. There were two other bullet points that are in there that I, we didn't necessarily come to consensus around, but just said, eh, let's, sure. Um, one was if they promulgate regulations that have a significant impact on the town or the community, um, regardless necessarily of whether we ever have to approve them. Um, and then the other one was the idea that if they distribute funds that are sourced from local tax dollars, um, they would be useful. We then set about applying that criteria to all of the existing committees and also trying to work in there the voting we had uh, at our council retreat. We came up with nine, yes, nine committees. Um, what is interesting about those nine committees is you will notice that they don't all conform to the criteria that I just explained to you. And in fact, some don't at all. Um, and so what ended up emerging were there were some committees that were very clearly checked one, two, or three of those boxes. There were a few committees uh, that OCA felt that even though they don't check those boxes, because they deal with populations, residents, communities that are often marginalized, that are often underrepresented, that it would be useful to have a liaison to elevate the concerns of that community. And so you have the nine in here. Uh, I am open to hearing suggestions about uh, whether you feel like that is an appropriate nine, whether there are ones that you think should be in there and shouldn't be, with the understanding that you already read the report and are not just going to throw out your pet committees without having read the reasons why they were not included, which I went to careful detail to explain to you. Um, the other side of this that I want to add, because as Lynn mentioned, of, of prioritizing this is um, you could tell us tonight these are the nine committees you want liaisons to. OCA has not decided how it will go about actually recommending appointments, and OCA does not view that as a priority at this moment. There are other things that we need to do um, first. And so uh, while I understand there may be town committees who are just begging for liaisons, um, regardless of the conversation we have tonight, I don't want to pour cold water on that, um, but there will be no recommendations for liaison appointments, at least within the next two council meetings. So one of the options is to um, suspend the rules, <laughs> go, with the, go with the memo and the recommendation, and then at the very end, you suggest that we use the kind of polling process I've used in the past 
and then the council would select from among those interested, right? So it's a way of shortcutting through this, but we're open to suggestions. Mentia. So I, nine given our already busy schedules almost seems like a lot to me, um, but I don't know what to do with it. Um, but I do have a suggestion for the zoning subcommittee recommendation. Um, as chair of CRC, in working with trying to come up with the master plan process and all of that, I had a lot of conversations with the chair of the planning board. Um, so if there's going to be a liaison, and there's already a request from the planning board for during this planning process that the CRC designate a representative to attend the meetings that the planning board is talking about the updates at. So I, I, and CRC has that on an agenda to talk about, which would be in some sense separate from liaisons, and I explained to the, the chair of the planning board our discussions on liaisons and what liaisons are set to do and what they're asking for a CRC representative to do is completely different. Um, but, but having talked with the planning board chair in doing some of this, I'm concerned that a zoning subcommittee, a liaison to the zoning subcommittee would be yet another person for people on the planning board to liaise with, along with the CRC chair, and then possibly during this nine month process, yet another person. So I, I don't know what to do about that other than maybe consider for that particular committee, given how CRC interacts closely with the planning board anyway, to maybe designate either the chair or the vice chair of CRC. And I'm not one that even when we, I'm gonna say this now, I did not request a, a liaisonship to the planning, I don't think I did to the zoning subcommittee when we did this back at the last retreat. Um, but from, from the chair's point of view, from my point of view as chair of CRC, I think it would make sense if you're going to designate a liaison to the subcommittee to some sort of planning board subcommittee or planning board itself that it be either the chair or the vice chair of CRC by default. Any further discussion on that issue? Evan? Sure. I mean, I think that the conversation we need to have first is are these the correct nine before we figure right. out? Because I think you could make a similar argument for a few of these that there should be a certain person. Um, one thing I, I want to make, I said this in the report, I want to make sure I stress because it speaks to the workload is um, a reminder that your expectation as a liaison is that you will receive agendas and perhaps skim minutes and keep in some type of regular communication with the chair of the body in order to be a conduit of information, there is absolutely no expectation that as a liaison that you are regularly attending these meetings. And so I, I wanna make sure we understand that as we're having that conversation because I don't want anyone to hear, oh, being a liaison means I have to go to all the meetings and that's a huge workload and there's no way we can get nine counselors onto this. It's, I view it almost as a, a, an additional document you have to read for a packet, and that's about it. Um, I have a slightly off cycle question, and it's to ask GOL whether you will be coming forth for the next agenda with the recommended changes to committees. That's my hope. Okay. So if we bring that forth next time and move on it, and we take this next time and move on it, then I would be polling for a lot of things all at once, but it also makes putting the puzzle together, though a little complicated, it makes it somewhat easier. Yes? I can, we will bring I hope a proposal, but I can't obviously guarantee that it'll pass muster. They're going I, to I right, certainly right. understand so that. that, but that one may way throw or the other, we got to move on. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, um, is there any further discussion on the nine um, 
committees that have been listed here. Yes, George. Just a quick question for Mandy. I wonder if it, what she's describing as what the planning board wants from CRC doesn't seem to match what we think liaisons are supposed to do. So maybe the simplest thing here would be just to take this off the board because um, it sounds like you having establishing a relationship with planning. Uh, or would you say, no, it's not going to be a problem? It sounds like what a liaison is supposed to do is not exactly what um, the planning board is looking for from CRC. Mandy, explain Joe. a little more. Um, what the planning board has asked of CRC for the master plan update process is for a representative of CRC to attend the meetings of the planning board where that pro where those updates are being discussed in order to participate in the discussion of those updates. And I have told the planning board chair that that would be in conflict with the right. council's idea of a liaison, um, hence the idea that CRC now has on its agenda on Wednesday a discussion of designating a representative because I don't think it is compatible with the potential designation of a liaison. Um, one other thing I wanted to say though with liaisons for planning board and all, with the council's vote that CRC be the joint holder of hearings for bylaw changes to the zoning bylaw, that requires a coordination between chairs. Um, or, or between chair of the subcommittee and chair of the CRC in order to, to already sort of coordinate stuff like that, which is almost a liaisonship. So it goes back to what okay. I was saying before. So here's what I'm going to suggest. We not vote on this tonight, okay? We bring it back next week. I'll move it earlier in the agenda so that we're not dealing with it at this hour. And we either decide at that point to add or eliminate from this list and move forward. Okay, any further? Yes, Kathy. I like that idea a lot, and I would just like one page with the list. I don't want to have to read the memo again. I mean, I'm, I don't, I mean, I know I have the memo. I we'll, just- We'll the, focus on, we have to include the memo only because of the items in it, but yeah. yes, thank you. The, the list is on the first page, so. Yeah. Any further discussion? Uh, yes, Alyssa. I'm sorry. So if people, I wish you hadn't said if we're gonna just add or delete based on what Evan said earlier. So if anybody wants to add or delete anything to this list, then I think you need to talk to Evan before mm -hmm. the next meeting, not bring it up on <laughs> at the next I meeting think very in, good in, in hopes that perhaps mm -hmm. Oka will have time to discuss that before the next meeting. Please okay. don't do it on the fly at the meeting. And you meet on the Monday morning before our next council meeting on the 24th, okay? Any further discussion on that? All right, we're moving on to appointments by the uh, town manager. I, uh, does anybody see any reason why we can't go through all three of them and do a consensus vote? No? Okay, all right. Go ahead. Move them individually or as part of one motion? Just move them all. Different motions, okay. right? Okay. Different motions. Uh, okay. So, so first I will say that OCA recommended approval of all of these appointments unanimously. Good? Cool. So okay. I move to approve the following town manager appointments to the Council on Aging effective immediately as recommended by the 210-2020 Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee report for three-year term to expire June 30th, 2022, Jacqueline Smith-Crooks for a one-year term to expire June 30th, 2020, Greg Bascom, Timothy Neal. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Moving to the next one. Okay, so I am going to move to approve the following town manager's appointment to the Participatory Budgeting Commission, effective immediately as recommended by the 210-2020 Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee report for a term to expire on December 1st, 2020, or such additional time as necessary to complete the charge outlined in the charter, Jonathan McCabe. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay, next one. 
So I'm going to move to approve the t following town manager appointments to the Cultural Council, effective immediately as recommended by the 210-2020 Outreach Communications Appointments Committee report. For a three-year term to expire June 30th, 2022, Arthur Perro. For a two-year term to expire June 30th, 2021, Nicholas Graber Mitchell. For a one-year term to expire June 30th, 2020, Rachel Wang. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Yes. Alyssa. I'm hoping I'm not stealing Evan's thunder by saying this. Um, in future, we are probably not going to bring forward appointments with saying how many years the term is, because in case anybody wonders that just before midnight, that one year is not the end of June. Um, it just sounds funny to do it that way, so we're just going to use dates in future was our thought this morning when we were just, we also mentioned it to the town manager, and we all thought, hey, that's a good idea. We don't have to say one year, two year, three years, so don't be freaked out. If you see it without the years, it will definitely have dates. Thank you. Any further discussion? Motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. aye. Opposed? Abstain? All right. Um, I did polling for both Finance Committee and JCPC. Uh, on the Finance Committee, uh, first of all, we would like to thank Shalini for her year plus of service, but she has chosen not to be on the Finance Committee. Again, the people uh, appointed to the Finance Committee are Andy Steinberg, uh, Dorothy, Pam, Dorothy Pam, Lynn Griesmer, um, Pat DeAngelis, and Kathy Shank. Moving on, JCPC, I also polled for this. Um, there were really only three people who asked to be on JCPC. I forwarded those names to you. <coughs> Excuse me. They are, in fact, uh, Mandy Jo Haneke, Kathy Shane, and Andy Steinberg. This is a vote of the council, not the president's. I only do this as a service to get the names out there. So. Um, there is a motion to appoint Mandy Johanneke, Kathy Shane, Andy Steinberg, or others, if nominated and elected by the council to the Joint Capital Planning Committee, effective immediately. Is there a motion? I so move. Second. Second. All those in favor? Or is there further discussion? All those in favor, aye. aye. All opposed, nay. Abstain, for done. Uh, minutes. Excuse me. We have three. We have two sets of minutes. One is for our regular meeting, which was two weeks ago. The other is for the four towns meeting, which was just this past. No, I guess it was Saturday a week ago. And um, the are there any changes or corrections to either set? Okay, then uh, could I have a motion to approve the minutes of January 27th, 2020, Town Council meeting and February 1st, 2020, four towns meeting as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Uh, town managers, Report. I have four things. One is a reminder a cup of Joe on Friday uh, at Brugger's with our new principal assessor. Second is we'd already talked about the early voting that will be at UMass at the end of February. Third, uh, there was a, a site visit at 132 Northampton Road today. Three members of the council were there, as well as neighbors and staff, as well as the state and the proponents or the uh, applicants. And fourth, um, I sent you just before the meeting uh, an announcement that there, we have a partial agreement on the strategic partnership agreement with the university uh, where they will provide um, $185,000 uh, to, um, to, to the town for use by the schools uh, divided between the regional school district, a minor amount, but the most of it being in our elementary schools. That number will be included in the superintendent's budget, will, which will be presented to the, um, regional, to the school committee tomorrow night. So that's a partial agreement that we have reached for three years, the current fiscal year, FY21 and FY22. 
Uh, we have a ways to go for the rest of it, but because of the status of the school department's budget, we thought it was important to get this piece out of the way and approved, and we appreciate the university stepping up and agreeing to make this announcement with us tonight. Okay. Yes, Dorothy. Um, I think I remember there was a deficit in the proposed school budget. How does this affect it? Well, the, the um, school budget has, will be balanced is because that's what the superintendent does. They had some, well, the good news with our health insurance that coming in at 1.89% was the major proponent of that reason for it. Okay. Is there any uh, quickly committee reports? Anything further from CRC? Nope. Anything further from finance? Just one thing, uh, supplementing what was just said. Um, I've been in contact with other communities and with the, the chair of the regional school committee. We now have an agreement on both a budget and a method for uh, regional assessment for next year. Excellent. Um, GOL? I'm sorry? Can we get an idea of what that agreement is? Yes. Andy? Um, it's the 45% because the um, dollar amount of the budget went down for some of the reasons that Paul had indicated um, that enabled all four towns to, to come to agreement that that was an acceptable for the one year. And, and one of those was the very low insurance rate. Okay, any further question on that? All right, um, GOL? I just wanna thank uh, those counselors who sent us uh, written comments uh, related to the committee restructuring proposal. Um, those were discussed and, and appreciated. Also got excellent comments today from uh, members of OCA. And uh, so uh, I'm optimistic that we can bring to you a proposal next time uh, for discussion. Um, there, I think there are going to be issues about what happens to appointments and to how long OCA, whether OCA should be dissolved or not. But I think there is a general consensus at least about taking CRC and dividing it into two. Um, and again, any <coughs> comments that you want to add are welcome. Um, we'll have a discussion on Wednesday taking into consideration in particular comments we've gotten today from OCA. Okay. OCA? No further report. And uh, percent for it, Kathy, I'm just going to buy, I'm going to bypass that if you don't mind and just say on our agenda on the 24th will be the first reading of the percent for art bylaw okay i just want to tell you that for all of those who just like to get things in advance we'll probably be able to post all those materials within the next day or two so it'll be two weeks in advance of the meeting <laughs> i mean that they're all done um so there will be a, a a collection of documents Okay, there's no topics as reasonably expressed. No additional topics. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. Alyssa. I do have actually an additional uh, a 48, less than 48 hours. I'm okay. sorry. I'm so tired. I have no idea what I'm even saying anymore. And I had a couple of suggestions for next time. Which I'll just save till next time. But actually one is that we have executive session at the beginning of the night, not the middle of the night, not the end of the night, but we start early. We done this in previous iterations of life and I know it's hard to change your schedule yeah. but wow that would help anyway my my unanticipated item is the project eligibility letter associated with 132 Northampton Road we are in a different position than the select board was as an executive body the select board was the one who actually had the cover letter that had all the attachments that were everybody's comments that we sent off to DHCD we're not in that position under the charter. That's the town manager now. But we as a town council should have a position on what's going into DHCD, which means we need to know what their criteria is, which we have that information available to us, but we haven't had a discussion. And I didn't know if that's on our agenda for the 24th because we're almost out of time. It's not, it, the comment period does not end until the 29th. And I would assume if we're going to look at what the town manager is forwarding that's what we would also then look at for us was you thinking we're going to have a separate statement i'm thinking the town manager can't get all that done with 
by the 24th, and it's not up to us to approve his package. It's that we would have a letter from the town council in there as well, as opposed to, because otherwise, there's no reason for 13 individuals not to write in, and that doesn't really make any sense to DHCD to have 13 individuals writing in. So I feel like we have to have a town council position. I will say the same thing when it comes time for the ZBA hearing. But as the chief elected officials in the community who've heard tons about this, I can't see that we wouldn't write something. Again, there are there are clear criteria. I'm not telling. We're not going to make it up out of our heads. There are criteria as to what they what they want addressed in a letter, that's easily available. But that does mean someone would have to write it, <laughs> and we're all nearly out of time. Right. Um, let me come up with a way for without breaking open meeting law for consultation on that, and bring forward a draft that you get to see in advance. Okay. Great. Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. Yes. yes, a second. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye.